ourselves now. We are Squawking Dead, a podcast pulverizing episodes of the Walking Dead universe. Sometimes we give you news, sometimes we make you laugh, but most times, as in this time, <laughs> we'll go deep. I'm already dreading this episode. Just to put like a bow on it, compare this to like some of the few times we've covered The Walking Dead World Beyond and how mm. there's sometimes, and even like, um, well, even the first episode of Fear, like how there's just, you know, there's a lot of things to muse on and talk about, but like not a lot of things to go deep on. But this is this a stark mm. contrast to that. I was trying to pick things up like left and right because I feel like we're watching this through the eyes of a cop. We're looking for evidence. This John Dory centric yeah. episode. So, I even I even wrote in my notes this this felt like watching an episode of Criminal Minds. Were you as dreadful of covering this episode as I was? <laughs> um yeah i mean i don't know i'm i'm excited but there's a lot to to unpack yeah i did like the episode um i mean it made me feel really bad for john but i i liked it i mean it was good entertainment <laughs> but at the end of it yeah, i just kind of yeah. felt Ugh. yeah and i and i feel you because by the end of it you feel like there's a struggle going on uh, between john and the truth this is something like that we go back and forth on when it comes to season four the big a big theme in season four was Althea saying, saying the truth out loud, if only once, makes even the, the, the impossible possible, that sort of thing. And like this, this idea of unburdening and truth is, is spoken about in this episode as well, and, and even in a false context. So this really is kind of like a mirror darkly of season four in particular. But I like how we're returning to this theme of the truth. I, and what I like even more is how we pair this episode with just the last episode. One of the big things that we talked about when it came to Althea is the idea of her going after the truth, you know, record documenting to the living to, as like a, a means of her raison d'etre to kind of show what's going on out here to for whoever's whoever's going to remain our story, right? And and I, again, and to make another leap, another hop, let's say, you know, when Elton talks about the endlings, I kind of like to pair this idea of the endlings, you know, as the last person of our species to survive, or the last of our species to, to survive before it ends, or the endling. And so I like how these three things kind of line up together in a weird way. The most interesting thing about pairing this episode with just the last one is the idea of Althea holding back, finally. And instead of mm -hmm. sacrificing her brother for the truth and to go after the story, she says, it's not worth it. But when, you, when it comes to John by the end of this episode, John cannot help himself. But in a weird world where he gave up being a cop previously, and yet he's fighting to keep that part of him to know which way is up, it's just who he is, that sort of thing. And he cannot stop himself. So it's this weird thing where one person knows who she is, and yet she can still pull back. But John keeps going further and further. He cannot help himself from from finding the truth or or rooting the truth out, so that he knows which way is up. And so I like that pairing. I like that back and forth on there. So just to dovetail off that, perfect, Sharon. To see now you cut you got the cut of my jib right now, huh? <laughs> I, she says I don't think it's a coincidence that they're sand sandwiching a Dwight and Sherry episode in between a John episode and a June episode, and this idea of Althea also just to kind of there's this John episode which also yes has a has a Dwight and Sherry element to it you know them reuniting and then the next episode oh, yeah, after yeah. this it is sandwiched in between a love story and the reason why I need to get that out of the way is because it seems to me that for most of these people for Morgan for Strand and for Dwight and Althea they kind of turn into this super saiyan version of themselves or super strand or <laughs> super strand three or whatever it's going to be but then you have John and I'm not 100% certain that's the case with him. I don't know what he becomes. And as this episode progresses, there's a lot of elements, and I just want to put this out there now so that we can explore those uh, those ideas specifically. There's this idea of rot. There's, idea, there's this idea, a subtle idea of poison as well, which you may or may not have noticed. Paired with also the revisiting of Strand's color blue as well. The, the little band in his hat is is a blue color. And and all and there and some of these people will be acting as avatars too, you know, for John. And so keep that in mind as we, we navigate through this episode. So we start off with Morgan in Boomer's Boomin' Fireworks Shack. Buy one, get five free. I just there's something just so fucking funny about that. It's like, right. It's it's a fire five sale. Free. 
<laughs> which is which is the place where basically he's he, like you, it makes you wonder how Morgan's been getting his goods from Daniel, and then you figure out that okay, in between trips of him going back and forth between Lawton and in all these other places, Paradise Ridge, he must be stopping mm -hmm. off at this place and dropping off these things in his germicide. I was going to say germicidal lubricant in his germicide uh, box of where they put the combs in the little blue fluid. <laughs> yeah. So one it's of the barbicide, things he, but I don't know if it, that, that's probably just a brand name. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what it is and so which is why they had to use germicide um germicide the barbasol or whatever yeah exactly one of the few things that he, we find out he drops in in one of these boxes is grace's jacket the, the very jacket she wore grace's blue jacket blue jacket that's that's right foreshadowing oh my god grace is a strand everybody run <laughs> we don't she's gonna betray him oh sad morgan anyway so <laughs> So it's yeah, terrible. this is like one of the things I wanted to actually pick on the first episode because the first episode was interesting in that like I kept wondering how Emil was finding Morgan with no like how did he get a scent off of Morgan? It's one of the big things mm -hmm. I was trying to think of. Like and yeah, I I don't have an answer for that, right? Do you? Because I either. didn't. No, no. Right. Yeah. How did he get? How did he get Morgan's scent? Right. Right. Morgan Jones has been through here. I'm like, how do you know? How do you know? <laughs> right. How do you know? I don't know how you know. The only thing he 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 had a picture of him but that's not gonna help rufus at all <laughs> little baby morgan <laughs> picture <laughs> and then how did he get that right did she did jenny describe it i guess that you could probably explain but like I, yeah, the picture w I the picture made more sense. Like obviously, Emil went to wherever Ginny was, and she drew up a sketch to go find him. But but the scent, I could not figure out how Rufus knew where he was going. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't no. make sense. Unless unless okay, now I figured it out. <laughs> Shit. Unless he went back to Humbug's Gulch, because if he did, there's tons of Morgan's blood around, and that's that's a spot where Ginny definitely knew they could get a scent, an actual blood scent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. <sighs> I hate Could solving started my, right from there. I hate solving my own problem, but I also like it because then people <laughs> it answers the bone people would have to pick from that episode. But going back to Grace, clear evidence, Grace, jacket, okay, we're good, we're rocking, we're rolling with Rufus, Rufus the dog, and we're off to the races. And then let's just go straight to the end because it, it, did I cover it? I think I covered it, right? Yeah. Um I mean, yeah, I mean, Dan yeah. Daniel has a note, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Daniel yeah. left the letter there. Yeah. Moving along. Okay, we're rocking, we're rolling. <laughs> end of the episode. <laughs> The one thing I wanted to point out by the end of the episode is that just like just like Daniel, <laughs> unlike Daniel, Morgan actually catches himself talking to a dog and expecting him to answer. <laughs> right. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then after he gets hit by the car from the, the death cult people, maybe, maybe. I'm not you I know, just call them the spray painters. <laughs> the spray paint that's right. But I say maybe because I'm not sure. I'm not sure if these people are the same maybe though it's definitely the spray paint guy but de but we don't know about the mannequin mask people right no but we're, we're not sure about them but these are definitely the spray painters right and we're going to find out more the mannequin masks are going to be appearing in the next episode and one of those things and charity i'm going to beat you to the punch because i think you know already that one of the mannequin mask guys is actually raleigh Oh, right. I did not see that. <laughs> Sharon was is that, like, yep, <laughs> possibly was that le leaked out. Oh, well, possibly, Rally. We we got a close up of the face of one of them, probably through the the, the previews and the sneaks. But okay. the the speculation is hot that this is Rally, Walter's twin brother. <laughs> yeah, Walter, Walter's twin. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's the link. Walter and Rally yeah. are brothers. Okay, we. The, yes. It's over. It's over. We the connection is made. Rally sold out his brother got a meal to kill him <laughs> to get the key <laughs> okay that's it episode over everybody that's it we're done <laughs> close up shop this podcast is over we solved the mystery oh wait there's an episode next week and the week after that and the week after that fuck you fear the walking dead i hate working <laughs> anyway so um i love how yes and that's what i was going to get to sharon like jokingly even after the car crash even after he caught himself saying i can't believe i'm talking to, to a dog expecting you'd answer me back he goes are you okay? <laughs> to the dog. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, it's just like, and he goes, oh. I, think, I think all pet owners talk to their animals as if they can understand them. <laughs> yeah. But then it, then it strikes me that like, okay, like has Morgan ever owned a pet? And probably not. 
Well, I don't know. I mean, he maybe might have this, before. Maybe this is one of those 16 different somebodies. Like, oh, I've never been a pet, pet owner. <laughs> Good place to start. <laughs> right. <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm reinventing myself. Um, he deserves a dog. <laughs> spoiler alert. It's clearly him in the sneak peek, <laughs> Sharon D says. But she also says, I, I jokingly asked Mo, as she jokingly asks many people on Fear the Walking Dead, I'm looking at you, about Raleigh <laughs> a couple times now. And I know I know now why she, she didn't answer. Or uh, Tabitha the goat, right? I remember Tabitha the goat, yeah. Oh yeah, Tabitha. Morgan had Tabitha, Tabitha the goat as a pet. Uh, this was on The Walking Dead, though, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, it was the Ethan episode. Yeah. Or ar around there. Because right, mm -hmm. he made cheese, right? If I'm not mistaken. He was a, he was... Um, yeah, from Tabitha's goat yeah. milk. Yeah. Exactly. Rip Tabitha. <laughs> Five years ago. Aww. Or more. <laughs> I don't know at this point. <laughs> Probably more, because even that episode was a flashback at the time. <laughs> right, right. But g moving to moving to the end of the beginning, guys. What's interesting is that we're we're willing to discard them even in this episode, which is interesting because the spray paint dude was the only dude we knew. Was the other guy in the first episode part of that scene? No, right. The other guy that meets up yeah. with spray paint dude was is he the other guy in that scene? He's the guy who got gutted. Yes. Okay, so we got rid of both of those guys from the beginning episode. Is that what we're all saying? Yes. I wasn't sure about yes. the second guy meaning the the guy that got his guts all spilled out yeah this the spencer wannabe he <laughs> was the one who said we need to uh wait someplace else okay <laughs> so that is the same which is which is why when they opened up with the uh sort of previously on fear the walking dead they showed his face okay so that's interesting yeah that's very interesting i thought it was interesting that they were waiting for emil and not walter we had posited that they were waiting for walter yeah well it's a double but they were waiting for a meal it's a double whammy because okay we thought we were waiting for walter but it turns out they hired emil to get at walter but at the same time yeah that's the double whammy they have no idea who virginia is who's right who's virginia yeah so i i wanted to study his face so closely during that scene to see if he was genuine or if it was like well who do you think jenny you know what i mean like who are you to jenny i don't know like, but he did seem genuine didn't yeah, he? yeah i mean look when you're facing a guy with a <laughs> you know it yeah, just yeah. gutted your friend right and then and then it makes me wonder how do you live in this area and not know who virginia and her rangers are i can well listen it's texas it's huge so i can see that <laughs> as a possibility look G jenny does keep to her settlements and has these specific routes that they go that they go through between each settlement i can see a world in i feel like they're pretty spread out though don't you spread out but not spread thin you know confined but not stretched out to the point where she cannot manage them i mean i can easily see right, that i can right. easily write that off meaning i can see a world in which these people's paths will not cross or let's even let's drill down on that further just a little bit and you know we'll get this out of the way and we'll move on to john again <laughs> i know sorry okay hold on <laughs> but it could be that these people are coming out of hiding these people were somewhere else and th okay. that somewhere else is some place we could talk about uh, as it relates to this episode this okay. might be a good segue but yes if we are talking about these people possibly being a religious cult and it does connect yeah. to what to possibly to what dad john dory's dad's case is connected to a serial killer who was a two-bit mortician who everybody's a philosopher who had this saying about the end he's he says specifically two-bit mortician spouting about death and new beginnings so again the end is the beginning so if this is the case they were probably in a compound in the middle of nowhere in the houston area which is not necessarily where they are and they are on a mission somewhere in this area and have no idea who jenny is yeah i like Nisa's point too. They they could know about the Rangers and just not know that Jenny's in charge of everyone. I that's a very good point. And, and that makes a lot of sense because they know they have to at yeah. least well, I don't know. I don't know. The reason why I don't know, and maybe they don't know, is they do know Walter. And it may be that Walter escaped with the key. Let's make up some things about Walter while we're at it. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's take a minute to think about this if they have no idea who Ginny is and they only know who walter is walter may have escaped them this end of end is the beginning cult walter may have, is is raleigh's twins brother twin brother who found himself at the, <laughs> yep. at the death cult place <laughs> <laughs> and, and he escaped his brother and the death cult people with the key that they needed that they were trying to take back let's say entirely possible and they mm -hmm. hire the the talents of a bounty hunter to get it back the ba the <laughs> bounty hunter emil has been following him for how many days it was like two days you know on foot or whatever who knows or whatever within his mm -hmm. truck comes across him finally get, you know gets the job done and i think the, the only reason emil knows about virginia is well i don't know who cares but that's the idea is that they may be mutually exclusive and it just so 
happens that Walter finally found his way through to Virginia and then escaped Virginia too. Or has nothing to do with the other, by the way. He I I'm thinking Walter has nothing to do with Jenny now. Yeah. I mean when we when Emil first comes across Walter and he's like, Oh man, these guys have been following me ever since Lexington or whatever he says, whatever city he says. We all we all assumed it was Jenny's group, but he might not have any affiliation with her whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. It might have been all about the death cult. Well, that, you know? Again, sleight of hand, right? Like we assume from the beginning that this guy was with Jenny, but it wasn't just because he had a key, yep. but it wasn't a relevant key. key. Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> it, it really threw us off, like majorly. Laredo. Oh, Laredo, right. Laredo, Texas. So Laredo, yeah. <laughs> see, we know the geography of who is whom now, at least, or at least we know what not to know I think so. <laughs> in, in relation to this. So we're starting to put the pieces together. Yeah, yeah. we know what we can't know. Like we, we're putting the corner pieces to the puzzle. <laughs> but, yeah. So I'm we starting know, to see the outer edge of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what doesn't connect. And so, which means that we know what to rule out. It's kind of like the uh, the Sherlock Holmesian thing. Like, uh, what what it, what is left must be the truth, right? Yeah. No matter. Yeah. No matter how unreasonable, whatever left is must be true. Mm -hmm. Right. Until we read that. Something, out. Like, something like that. <laughs> which is what we do. We're the weed out. We're the right. weed out gang. By way of me doing this, by way of me just getting at the heart of this thing, we can maybe talk about some of the ancillary things that that kind of support what I'm saying. My whole thought process starts with John securing the crime scene. And that's when things start to go crazy. Because almost everything that happens at this point is, and I'm going to emphasize this because I want you all to listen. Ginny is no dummy. Can we say it together, kids? Ginny <laughs> is no dummy. That's the weird no. thing. Okay. No. If you watch, if you watch this episode from end to beginning, you realize how smart she actually is. We, I'm going to, you know, maybe I'll read the notes bottom to top. It'll make actually more sense. So John is found out for the letters and still pursues what's good, right? Sadaka. He, he realizes that Ginny knows about his th about his thoughts of his father, like knowing, trying to figure out which way is up. So she knows that already. Okay, mm -hmm. she does not know about him planting the evidence. So that's a, that was a talk between he, he and Rabbi Kessner. So I figure let's plant that flag. You know, she, he knows about righteousness. He knows he's going to pursue the truth no matter what, etc. Okay. Yeah. She she also reveals in advance what she plans on doing with the killer. Like you know, a long time ago in my first settlement, something that also I found interesting. Like she finally talks about a little bit about stealing the can of tuna, making a show of things. Yeah. Okay. She tries to act disgusted about that too. Did you notice that? Yeah. She tries yeah. to sound disgusted. Like appalled but by she, it. Right. But I don't think she can. She can't hide what's underneath. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Nisa and Sherry yeah. are like, Jenny's no dummy, okay, says begrudgingly. <laughs> <laughs> but she does she also doesn't know that the word hero triggers him either. Oh you know? I don't want that for Lawton, and then she does it anyway. Nice Nisa. That's a good one too. So she basically even says out loud to John, This is going to happen, <laughs> yet I don't want it to happen. You see, she basically spells out what the punishment will be for this person. So don't do mm -hmm. it. So don't go after the truth. If you go after the truth, it might it might end up being that this is what's going to happen. You know, so let's step back from that for a second. Now, knowing what you know now, no, let's say you're John, knowing what you know now, this and looking at Jenny as an honest broker, when you know she's not honest, there has to be a part of you that goes, maybe you should stop. Because if you actually find the person who did this, the punishment isn't going to fit the crime. Yeah. You know, or, or I, I don't know. I was trying to make sense of why John would go to Jenny in the first place. I mean, is it that he trusted her? Is it that he is trying to get her to do the right thing or is he just gauging her reaction based on what he's saying to her i i really i really don't know i i almost feel like he is caught up in this and i don't want to say enjoying it but he feels you know like he has a real purpose now he's not just you know in the beginning of the episode we see him going through all these mundane steps oh here's my day here's my morning i go do this then i go do that this is something that kind of shakes things up and he's like um you know this is this is what I would have been doing. This is why I became a cop, right? To get to the truth, to seek justice. Here I have an opportunity to do that. To and anchor, I think he- To, to part anchor of him, him in the of, moment. Yeah, I think part of him kind of got caught up in in that. Maybe he wasn't even thinking so far ahead as to what might happen to the person that, that he finds out. Or maybe he's just so convinced that Ginny's somehow behind it, he can kind of show everyone, hey, look, you know, look who Ginny really is. 
I mean, that's a long shot, but John's hopeful, so he might think he can pull it off. So I don't I don't <laughs> think he means to put this on Ginny per se, though. That's the thing. I feel like he does everything in his power to not go down that route, even though there's a part of him that is gnawing at him, not unlike a Not toothache. to investigate? Not, no, well, not to go down the Ginny route, or if it is Ginny, she's covering up for somebody. So meaning it's not Ginny directly. Like, you could feel that from him, that he's trying not to indict Ginny outright. And that, yeah, that m most of the time for in this episode, he's like basically saying, no, 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 I just want to know what the truth is. You know, it, it, it's too easy to be Ginny. It can't be Ginny. Ginny is my, you know, my uh, chief. My, you know, you don't automatically assume it's the police chief. You know what I mean? So that's the thing. John just does not seem to know which way is up. Now, I'm glad you brought up the mundane in the beginning of the episode because, and we're going to get into this a little bit more, but the opening does resemble a dark mirror version of Laura, the way it opens up. It's literally yeah. the, almost the same scenes, you know, the overhead shot of him in bed, the, uh, the, the, the view from his window from outside. Although, again, to kind of show how dark this mirror is, instead of like a, a wide open uh, window full of light, light coming through, when you see him in the bed, the light in Laura is, is present on him. It's wide open. He seems to be in a peaceful sort of setting, you know, this kind of no man is an island sort of thing where he's got everything he wants and needs in the apocalypse, and yet he feels lonely. But here, it's sort of the same, but it's different. It's obviously like a like a like a dark version of that, where you know the the blinds are kind of half open. There's not a lot, not a lot of light coming through. His cabin felt more open. Like the sinks looked sort of the same, but time had taken its toll on the porcelain and made it look kind of grody and rotten. The general idea of being rotten, that sort of thing. Yeah, and Sharon D's saying shot for shot. You know, it's kind of like going back to your point. He wanted to believe in this place that he had a purpose here. You know, it's kind of like what you said it's like it's like he he lost himself in this purpose it, it almost somewhat in the way he lost himself in june like june makes him feel alive again the idea of him being a cop and this idea of tzedakah or like i'm gonna say righteousness because it's a little bit easier but the idea of righteousness and the truth and and what's right and what's wrong what's up and what's down you know mm -hmm. sustains him it makes him it, it propels him forward in a way that he didn't know he could before whereas if he didn't have this purpose you know the rot would have taken him over but the thing literally is, i mean look at his tooth his tooth is literally rotting out of his face and he's not doing anything about it i was telling sharon D, I i think he i don't know if i want to say wanted to but i i'm almost there but he was ready to die in this episode right from the beginning you think right from the beginning okay so can you explain that a little yes. bit more though uh well the his tooth is what gave it away for me i mean and then when jenny says hey you should probably get that checked out it, it it all but confirmed it he has the means to take care of this but he's not i think he almost wants it to get worse and septic and kill him see i was which is what, which is why he pulls it at the end because he finally has something to live for okay that's interesting so i I agree with the end that but not and i'll tell you why sort of but but i attribute the rot as the rot in this town like he's ignoring it he's trying to ignore what's staring him in the face not that he wants to off himself or anything like that but that he is he wants to live he wants to listen to morgan right the words echoing into his head into his head about just living right and he has he has the means ostensibly to communicate with june so he's not adrift you know, he has a connection to this world. He has... He tells comfort. Rabbi he knows he's never going to see her again. Oh, by the end of it, yes, yes. But let's let's go. But he, in, we're, but he we're knew still, that still at the beginning. Um, that, that well, information well, was the, still true. In 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 his letter though to June, he said, "Who knows if we if we play our cards right?" And I'm like citing it from memory because I can't find it for some reason. Perhaps one day we can be together here. So he does believe, you know, and and maybe this idea of a purpose makes him feel like he can believe. So he's not like a man adrift. Just from what I'm seeing, like you know, the idea of continuity, the fact that he even can muse about his father is a way for him to kind of I think even also like think about what he doesn't have but also like the fact that he still has the ability to communicate with her and one thing to make clear is that he does receive letters back but we don't know what the contents are which is interesting right he does receive a letter from June in the second day so his letter seems to make it to June and he seems to be able to get a letter back to almost the next day you know if we're looking at continuity right possibly I mean that letter looked like it had been been through 
through some shit. The one that he received from June, it looked That's pretty true. worn. I kind of thought, hmm, how long did it take to get there? Yeah, and we do have the idea of uh, 246 days uh, with no incident. So like almost a year with no incident of somebody not dying. That there was before John got there? Isn't that what he said? 200 whatever days before he got there? Yeah, eight months. Well, yeah, up until the day, right? So when at the time of him okay. writing this letter. So, okay, so Sharon D's saying before he got there, eight months. And um, I also want to mention something. She, she, Sharon D says also, I don't think he wanted to kill himself necessarily. He had been communicating with him all this time period. Don't, well, don't, that's not, I'm not saying he wanted to kill himself. I'm saying he's re he was ready to die. There's a difference. <laughs> meaning like it doesn't like to die for a purpose or to like, can you, can you drill well, down sure. on that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I don't know. In the beginning, I just, I no. in the beginning, I don't think there was, there was a reason. I think he just thought if this is, if this is the time, this is the time by the end, you know, he's, he wants to sacrifice himself for Janice. You know, he's, yeah. he's just ready is, is what I'm saying. I'm not saying he wanted it or that he was going to kill himself. I'm just saying he was ready. He felt, I felt like John was ready to die if he needed to. Okay. I'll tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wrong. It's an opinion. So yes, no, I'm just kidding. I, I say that, I say, <laughs> Opinions I say that can't jest. be wrong. So go ahead. Um, but the reason why I don't feel <laughs> that we're in the same place on that is because I don't think it's about wanting to live or wanting to die. I think it's more about what John is committed to and what I'm going to talk about a little later is what Strand knows that John can be like when, when it comes to things he's committed to doing. And so we'll definitely come back to that because it's not even about, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it's about being prepared to die for a cause yes that's true um and then also not caring about the cost which is another thing something strand is actually keenly aware of um when he talks to alicia in his episode you know what what it'll cost if he if they go after the rangers and then start you know busting out okay so wait they'll get all our friends john doesn't know this or john hasn't had the talk that that strand has had because strand's been in right. and we have to also remember that strand was just outside a lot and <laughs> <laughs> kicking shit around Marcus. <laughs> and um, so I don't know if I felt that in the beginning, but I do feel that by the end, as he goes down this rabbit hole, this flame that he cannot avert himself from, this idea of pursuing something at all costs in spite of what it'll cost Janice, which he kind of knows about already, and yet he still pursues it, even in the face of somebody planting evidence. So again, this is this weird thing where John cannot help himself, even though he knows the costs. But I kind of want to go back to the idea of the rot though of because there's two things that i noticed in the first scenes and again like going back we, yeah we do see a lot of allusions to laura this dark episode you know ignoring the toothache trying to continue as normal but like you know knowing that there's a problem but he can't acknowledge it you know whether it's a tooth in his face or the shit in this town and the rot being Ginny. let's just call a spade a spade on this one but there's also another thing going on here too because as he lights the burners i thought i saw something very interesting when he lights the burners for his coffee or when you see the flame of the burners what kind of color is it it's a, it's a weird color isn't it i don't know it just look like flames right but it was a little <laughs> green had a little green tinge to it didn't it and it, there's something you start I to i can't say i can't say i noticed the flames okay i did <laughs> i mean just that they were there <laughs> but what's great about it is that it starts it starts to alert you to other things green seems to be the symbol of let's start with the rangers badges actual rangers badges because mm. you do see the, the the pin that john has and john has a sort of brown Brown. Like, first of all, John overall seems to have this brownish earth tones, you know, brownish beige kind of color pattern, right? Yeah, seems to be in yeah. that mode. The Rangers seem to have this like sort of bluish, sort of greenish. The flag is green. And then you go back to the to the flame that he uses for his coffee in the beginning of this episode. It's also green. Green, a, a flame that's green is usually is usually an impure fuel source. So again, we're talking about rot. We're talking about impurities, right? In something that's supposed okay. to be fuel, right? It usually comes from copper and it's usually a sign of impure fuel. And if, and if you have this particular fuel source and there's copper in it, there is a chance that it's copper sulfate, which is poisonous. And so that's the thing. There's there's an element of poison. And as you step out the, as step out of the door of John's place, you start to see the, the kind of off-white walls and then the green posts. And then you see the green flag. And then you see the green of the ranger's out Outfits. And then you start to realize there is green is kind of like a symbol for the poison. What is the poison? Ginny is the poison. And so you see that theme kind of go around town. But the bluish, the bluish is 
something else though. I know that you guys are talking about blue, Nisa, but but then again, the flame is supposed to be blue. It's supposed to write, you know, and we've had these discussions <laughs> before about blue being innocence or calm, you know, that uh, that idea. When we talk about the blue paint, right? <laughs> Which we'll not get yeah. we're not gonna get into. But you know, <laughs> when you and the flame of his burners are just like ours, they're supposed to be blue, you know, pure, you know, clean fuel source, etc. But it's not. Again, like uh, there's a lot of symbolism going on in this episode that indicate like an impurity that there's there's a rot there's something going on and yeah and it's going on in john too you know and john like if you had to kind of answer the question of why you think john keeps going after this even though he knows that if he does you know janice is going to be put in the chopping block june might be put on the chopping block this is like we feel like we're going back to the althea conversation in a way like you know if if she keeps pursuing this isabel thing in spite of all the encouragement in spite of all the purpose in it like she could get isabel killed she she can get dwight killed she can get herself killed john sort of has the same thing going on here but if you had to guess like why does he keep doing this why does he keep moving in this direction can he not help himself is it something well, else? i think he well he's he stated to rabbi that he june's in a safe position because she's knowledgeable about medicine so i don't know that he necessarily feels like he's putting june in jeopardy i think he he feels like she's safe because she's um she's useful she has you know a big role to play but i don't know i honestly i i feel like maybe he feels like the normal again you know he talks a lot about when he was a cop and what happened the last time he had the badge on and maybe he's trying to make up for that and so he's like a dog with a bone and and he's like i'm i'm gonna get to the bottom of it like he knows something's up and i think the the cop in him needs an answer right the cop that he previously put down right like the cop part of him that he previously right. relinquished mm. right but you know if everybody's believing that he is drinking the kool-aid and he's fallen in with lawton and he's really believes in this place then he would take his his role seriously and when something like this happens of course he's going to take it seriously this is a big deal and jenny kind of wanted wants to just brush it under the rug and he's like um no and and she keeps saying you know people need to feel safe you know and he said it the best okay sure making them feel safe is one thing but don't you want to make sure they actually are safe and yeah, she she's kind of like mm, yeah i guess you're right i guess maybe I guess. <laughs> you know well that's that's an interesting thing too like when you <laughs> when you when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it in her speech at the end of the episode she mentions that like yes and you know the idea because i didn't write it down it was i thought it was just it made me mad <laughs> it made me mad to write down her speech <laughs> but she talks about the idea uh -huh. of of every Everybody, you know, knowing that this hero kept kept this yeah. community safe, you know, made everybody feel safe. Not actually safe, but feel safe. Ginny used it's him as, as a pawn. She, yeah, it's almost as if right she revealed herself, finally. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She yeah. like, it, it, is if it, but, and it's weird because it's almost as if John should have seen it all along or should have, or maybe he did see it, but just ignored it. And again, like we keep going back to this because in, you know, Sharon D's saying he wanted to believe in the place, you know, he wanted to believe that he knew which way was up. And he's, and he's giving Virginia the, every opportunity to make her promise real. Right. Like without, without, a, and I feel like this is also just taking another big step back. If you take a look at all of this and you realize what, what else does John have to like go on? You know, like, and, and you start to realize that like th these guys have been lucky. Uh, John has been kind of lucky. You're talking to a man who's isolated himself for a long time in the apocalypse, like a, almost three years, you know, he, or more, he, he isolated himself much in the way, because you have to realize he went into hiding after that incident with the cop with the with his accidental shooting or like his misfire mm -hmm. like he meant to disable but then he ended up killing the person he was trying to stop and so he went into hiding and figured out somewhere along the way so like three years or more that at some point oh the world went to shit you know and then he realized when he went into town again to get provisions oh everybody's dead you know so when you put that kind of john into the present and yes you know there was an incident with with martha which he didn't really have too much of a hand in except for maybe when they were in the hospital I mean, this guy has been hasn't been in front of bad people or like there's also the idea of authority too. Like so it may not even he can't even distinguish when he sees somebody with this kind of authority or that some this sort of authority can exist without some sort of rules or with some sort of laws or some sort of procedure. Mm -hmm. You know, and so he automatically assumes that procedure. But he he says something about this in his letter to June that there's something about having about his dad and having the a purpose and procedure and like a rule of law and knowing which way is up 
and he associates that automatically with Ginny. Like, this place can't exist without some sort of order and law, right? So he can't, mm -hmm. like, disassociate Ginny with law, right? And the town is called Lawton, so that can't help, okay? <laughs> Lawton, law town, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I'm trying to give John all the credit in the world because, like, he hasn't had to face bad people, essentially. Like, not really. Think about it. This guy's been away from the world, mm -hmm. and it went to shit, and he didn't really and get involved with people that would challenge that, you know, the, his idea of law and order. And and, and, and it's something that we all, we, we always said was like a boon about John is that like, oh yeah, he's a Rick without baggage. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now we're realizing, like, taking that to its logical conclusion is that John is going to find some baggage. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, like, I'm trying to square the circle because that's the only thing when I walk away from this episode is why didn't he just at some point stop? You realize that Ginny had said in the beginning when she was taking down the crime scene, oh, that's okay. Yeah, the men the fence. It's fine. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, cr no crime. Right. Let's, let's move on. You can't investigate bad luck. Exactly. But I'm going to, I'm going to rock your brains right now. And you're probably thinking the same thing that i am maybe hopefully is mm -hmm. that she knew john would continue mm -hmm. right yeah she was she was using she knew every single move john was going to make and she pushed him towards it and why did she because well i could think of a, a few reasons i mean she wants john under her thumb wait but she knows specifically why because of the letters oh yeah that she'd been reading the whole time mm -hmm. why did the crime happen in the first place why did cameron die in the first place I have a theory. Theories. Because he went to her about the letters, or he was caught with the letters. Because she admits, like, somewhere in the episode, this is about the time where she reveals that he, f that she knows about the letters between her and John, her and June, that Cameron mm -hmm. came to her. Yeah, Cameron told me just before he died, essentially. She said Cameron made sure, I read every single one, Cameron made sure of it. Made sure of it, yep. Mm -hmm. Now, now that's, that's... I, ha I have a couple of theories, and mm -hmm. it it's totally based on whether or not you even believe Jenny, whether right, or not right, Cameron right. actually did give her those letters, because we also knew know that Cameron and Janice were planning on leaving. So if he was right. gonna hightail it out of there, why would he be doing anything to help Jenny? But maybe he was. I don't. I don't know. Or yeah, maybe he was bargaining. I mean, so there's a lot of there's a lot of dimensions where this can go. Now, did he just mm -hmm. go to Jenny to go to Jenny? Because one of the things that Janice says about Cameron is that he's not perfect, but he listens. And so I mm -hmm. wonder if part of that imperfection is, you know, maybe he believes in this place too a little bit, in spite of the fact that mm -hmm. he kind of wants to leave it. So I want to know how, how was Cameron able to get the letters from Janice and then back to Janice to give to June and or John throughout this whole process? Like, at what point was Cameron giving Ginny the letters to, to where they wouldn't know or Janice wouldn't know? Right, right. That's, that's a good question because, oh, because maybe he intercepted it in the bag somehow. I mean, it's but clear you would have had to do it without Janice knowing too. Right. But we do see the that one of the photos the photos he sketches is of Janice while she's sleeping. So obviously he has some time on his hands while she's asleep. Mm -hmm. So like it makes me wonder, oh shit. Hold on a second. Let's take a step back. What if this is the, and this could be like giving Ginny a whole lot of credit. So are you ready for this? Okay. Strand employs Janice as a laundry girl, right? We learned this from the second episode. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ginny realizes this and probably probably already knows what Strand is probably going to use her for. Maybe. Well, let's take that and put it aside. But we already know, she already knows that she can't trust Janice. And yet, she's put in this position where she has the ability to send letters, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. What if Ginny got Cameron to be with Janice? Mm. He's not perfect, but he listens. Yeah, I'm sure he does listen. What if... I could see that. What if this was just Ginny getting rid of her own evidence and then Janice mm -hmm. is just a yeah. loose end, right? Isn't that crazy? Oh, I mean, I, I, I said Said, Strand probably knows more than what he's letting on, and Nisa's kind of feeding into that too. Strand said that he has his reasons to put Janet to put Janice there. I mean, this could have been a, a plan long in action. See, I'm not. I'm not there yet. I'm not I don't quite put there anything yet. past Strand, honestly. I, I wouldn't be surprised to find out he's 100% Team Ginny right now. See, that's the thing. I'm I'm going to tell you why I don't believe he's he's Team Ginny. He's still making believe, bad oh. choices, no matter whose side he's on. 
That's what I was going to say next. I, well, I don't know about good or bad, but here's the thing. You, we both know. We all know. Are we, are we going to be in agreement? This is what I was going to say next. But yeah, so yeah, Sharon, he's basically echoing what I said. Jenny knew that they were together. Jenny knew that Jenny knew that they were together, but she made Cameron keep it a secret so she could keep getting the letters. Gotcha. Okay. And Nisa says something interesting. I think Strand put her there because he wanted to help with the letters, but not that he's on Jenny's side. And I happen to agree with that. I think you're dealing with like two mental juggernauts, Strand and Jenny, trying to combat each other in a weird Weird way they're trying to play this game of chess you know strand pu puts his his rook janice on the board and then Ginny kind of crosses her, her off the map you know in her own way and she's playing a serious game too bring cameron into the fold her rick her rick her rook onto the map and trying to take her out that way i feel i do feel like cameron was working for Ginny by the end of things seemed like a nice enough guy but at the end of the day he's a maybe he's just as much of a boy scout as john in a weird way like he knows that there's a purpose to this place and that rooting out Janice as much as he probably did care for her was like his way of saying, but yeah, I believe in this place, you know, so I'm not going to turn my back on it yet. Like maybe, maybe, because in the allusion to that is what Janice says about Cameron at the end is that he's not, you know, he's, he's not perfect, but he listens, you know, we were both lonely. I thought we could be lonely together. And this is exactly almost why or how John and June get together. These are two lonely people, one who's who just lost her daughter at the FEMA center, trying to run away, trying to kill her herself maybe much in the way john is in this weird pursuit of almost killing herself now you know killing himself now but like this weird parallel where like two lonely people getting together and just while things are shitty all around trying to find something together and then maybe escaping that something because it has to it has to have worn on cameron after a while what he was doing intercepting these letters knowing that Ginny knows because now that Ginny knows he's a liability and now that he knows about janice janice being the one doing it he must have known that she was a liability as well so oh man i don't know i mean they were planning on running away together they had all the supplies so where right. does that put them? right and maybe this was his escape plan you know like at, at a certain point maybe he would have gotten out of it like maybe he felt bad reporting these letters but felt like he had no other choice right so was he a plan or not i don't know it's tough to say there's like this whole mythology we're, we're, we're trying to build on cameron that we can't really confirm or deny but like we do know that the stuff was there but we do know that he did make sure that Ginny was reading all the letters maybe he got found out maybe and he and he was you know forced to do it the whole time and he did and we do remember that like janice is distraught by the by the time she reaches his body so yeah i don't know and she probably already knows what's going on because she says i have no letters for you just outright you know mm -hmm. when she sees john next one so, of my theories was that they killed him because someone found out he was planning to escape yeah yeah exactly or or i, I, I she definitely didn't find the stuff that's one thing we know because john ends up right. finding it well, because john has it yeah yeah so that's that's one thing so it may it may not even be relevant that he wanted to escape or not i think Ginny would make sure that he couldn't escape like his his he was on borrowed time so but i want to go back to strand because something interesting about strand is that when strand starts to get involved he sees things from a view that nobody else is able to see and that is the angle of which if i let john go through with this because he's not going to stop he thinks more about the truth than he cares about people in some ways because john has to realize that he got janice killed at some point in the middle of all this you know because, john yeah i'm because, not blaming john i'm not blaming john for no, this one sorry I, i'm not, not gonna in blame, any way shape or form i'm not gonna blame john either but you have to realize nope. i you have to realize one thing is that if john would have just left it alone Ginny would have just written it off but because he went after it Ginny had the wherewithal or or whatever still didn't believe it was her at the time but whatever planting the evidence on i think planting the evidence on janice made it made her a target and so he has to feel in some way by the end maybe that in some way he had a hand in her dying do you know what i mean especially if you have to realize the order of which this thing unfolded jenny tells him tells i him think about, jenny was gonna kill janice no matter what whether no, john no. got involved or not janice is dead you and me know that but does john know that or does john realize that maybe he does let's say but like i'm saying in the He's, middle of I, in the middle of this process so. in the middle of this process the order of which which this thing unfolds is he's in her office she tells him the story about the punishment and then they have the feel you know feel safe versus actually safe and mm -hmm. then 
as he as they continue and they have the funeral for Cameron, the the evidence is planted, and it still doesn't dawn on him that you know, or I don't. That's the thing. I don't know if it dawns on him that because he kept going after it, this case got Janice killed in a way. And again, you could argue by the, he that really by, I, that by the I think end he really of it, thought he could find the truth. Right. He but, really wanted to find the truth before Janice died. Yeah, but that's the thing that what this episode is supposed to show you though is that by the end of it, John didn't know which way was up. He was the only one who didn't know which way was up. Rabbi Kessner knew which way was up. He says, I'm supposed to be this uh, appointed spiritual advisor. Like He says it in a way that's like, this is what I'm supposed to be, but I don't feel like it. Right. You know? So th the reason why I bring that up is because like, like, we talk a lot about like, if this didn't happen, this, this, and this couldn't have happened. Right? And so this is one of those things that really bugs me and makes me really feel for John. But this is where Strand comes in. <laughs> Strand comes in at a key pivotal point. And I have to say this, and you guys are going to hate me for it, but thank God for Strand in a way. Fuck Strand. Right. But wait, I'll tell you why I say that. Because you see it by the end of this, John realizes now he knows which way is up. And he wants to give Ginny the old up yours, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to realize that had he gone down this path, he could have gotten himself killed, which is something Strand does not want. Um, he could have gotten all of his friends killed, which is not what he wants and even june because as i saw him walking down the street with his gun in hand and we talk a little bit about like this episode being a dark mirror of june right of laura right sorry laura back in season four one of the big things that we might have forgotten about laura and the reason why he stops being a cop and the reason why he doesn't shoot his guns anymore right this is one one of the things you may have may, may or may not have forgotten is that he cleans the guns in the beginning of the episode but doesn't use them he cleans them puts them away whatever and when he says i don't use my guns anymore by the end of the episode he ends up using using them to protect Laura. He does this like weird trick shot <laughs> to save Laura. <laughs> he uses his guns finally at the end of this episode, not to save somebody, but to give them mercy, to give Janice mercy, finally at the end. The shovel in the grave pit mimics the shovel he was using in Laura as he was taking down like the walkers left and right with the shovels and stuff like that until he finally had to use the guns. There's a lot of mirroring going on. But, so we know what happens at the end where he uses his gun, right? But he's about to use his gun to like sort of make the same... I don't want to say mistake, but like the same, do the same thing that got him to hide away to begin with, to depress him so much to leave humanity. And that's going after Ginny. He doesn't realize this. Strand makes him realize this. Strand puts himself on the altar to get his ass beat to a, because he knows he's not going to best John. John is going to beat his ass up, but he puts himself in the way to get him to stop because he knows he won't stop if he doesn't put his body in the way. And by doing that, he saves John, he saves June, and whoever else is in his party and as much as i want to say fuck strand as well because he's the one who got janice to, to submit a confession there is so, there uh, there is a quality uh, to it that there is a quality to it to strand's actions if i'm john I, i'd be just as pissed as strand you don't get to decide my destiny i made this choice i will live with it get out of my way right and now john has to live with a whole other thing right which is so thank you strand i'd rather be dead <laughs> but now he has june the weird consequence of this yeah but does he really have june I that's a good question. A really, really, really good question. Because what's the first thing? What's the first thing he says when when he opens the door that next morning, the next fraught morning? Does he say anything? He they said, just hug, and said, then and then. Wait, wait, wait you missed just, you, what? You, you missed one thing. He says no. He he says no immediately. Like no, yes, no. I can't believe it's you, but like no, not you. <laughs> I don't, one of the things I also noticed in the beginning of the episode that you may not notice until like, like a third or fourth watch is that he doesn't have his ring on his finger. Like, yeah, like I did notice that. Like June does when you mm -hmm. see her from the beginning, he has his ring around his neck on a around chain because it doesn't fit. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. metaphorically, but also actually probably, but also metaphorically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Charity's saying it's not, it's not blame, but he ultimately got her killed because he didn't stop. Virginia killed Janice to teach John a lesson about doing what she says. And rewarded him with June as positive reinforcement. Oh, give a do give a John a bone. Um, I think sh I think she did it to torment him. Oh, I don't think it was a reward in any way. One hundred percent, it seals that was the not deal. A reward. In fact, it's it's probably keep your friends close and your enemies close uh, closer. That sort of thing. Like mm -hmm. you know, I know how you feel, but here's something that kind of twist the knife a little bit too right well but this look is what she just did to janice and now june is here so you better stay in line or look what could happen to june and it's almost the same thing with strand in a, in a weird way in his episode oh what was all this for oh it's for you to be the king oh, like for you, for you to be the army master thing person <laughs> 
but like torturing Strand in this weird way, like oh, yeah. torturing Althea yeah. with documenting the dead instead of living. This is why I said like like I I don't want people to think that Ginny is a dummy. This this you every episode shows me. Listen, at first it was a, sp a suspicion. I won't lie. I'm I'm bullshitting by the time I'm thinking this through. Because when we see her in season five, <laughs> it's like who the fuck is this person? <laughs> season yeah. six rolls around and I start to suspect that like because you know teasers and all that stuff, you start to suspect she can't be stupid. And then you know and you're bullshitting you're like i have a theory and then as every episode unfolds i'm realizing how just like super intelligent she is how she uses leverages john because she knows because of these letters just because of these letters on psychology alone knows that she, he will not stop until he gets at the truth or get the bad guy right whoever that is <laughs> lisa says uh strand is a savior thank goodness for him <laughs> Sharon says, "Love it." Uh, Sharon says, "Tackles him even even after John knocks his ass down." So yeah, Strand asks for more, you know, more punishment, please. So yeah, I'm sorry, Sharon. Yes, I'm not making you like you shouldn't like Strand. So that that's one thing I want to make clear. In a way, you can feel whatever you want to feel about Strand, but there are some facts that you have to be acknowledged: is that Strand put his body to stop John, stop him from getting himself killed, to stop John from uh, getting uh, himself killed. We we want we want to say, you know, yay, save your Strand. But honestly, do you honestly feel like? Like he did this for John because I don't whatever his master plan is is to save his own ass and whatever that plan is he needs John for it that's where Strand sits <laughs> so that may he wants John alive because Strand needs him that may be and true that's it. that may be actually true because here's the thing that I'm wrestling with the thing is the one thing that got me to think differently is that Strand at, when Strand finally comes into the picture he goes okay you find the truth and then what then we expose it and we make people you know when we and we find out the truth and that the truth will prevail you know tzedakah right the idea of righteousness right strand goes like this because you know what the answer is what what does Ginny value over the truth is for people to feel safe and strand sees that and knows that from her conversation he's strand is with a person with his eyes open john is kind of with his eyes with his blinders on and not really seeing the big picture and strand okay Okay, and Strand steps in, obviously, and does what he does and blah, blah, blah. But he goes, I almost answered the question for John, where John answers it incorrectly. Strand is almost telling John, and wasn't the whole point for people to feel safe, by you revealing the truth, you'll you'll inform the people that they know which way is up. Meaning, Ginny covered up this murder, and Ginny is pinning it on, on Janice. So what, what, what good is that going to do if everybody can't trust Ginny? What is Ginny going to do? And so here's the thing. First of all, do you think Ginny's going to let you get away with that? And and two, do you think Jenny, Jenny's not going to give up the ghost and Jenny's not going to let you expose this thing to people. She wants people to feel safe. So again, this would have gotten him killed and he, he still can't answer Strand's que question right. He still can't see. He, he can't see like the, the uh, he, he can't stop and he knows he can't stop. And the, you wait another day and Strand still sees he can't stop. And so he has to finally put his body in the way. So in a way, you hate it. I hate that, that he did this thing with Janice. I hate it with every fiber in my fucking being. But in a way, you're like forced to kind of go, fuck that smart. <laughs> It sucks. I, this is, Strand is doing all the things that Morgan is terrified that he's doing, right? Except Strand doesn't give a fuck. He's doing it without remorse. He's built for this, unfortunately. Yeah, but is that the kind of person you want to align yourself with? Do you want that person in your group? I don't. There's a, they yeah. will turn on you like that as soon as as soon as you are not useful to them anymore. The one thing that <laughs> the one thing that I will say, and I've said this before about Strand, is that everything he did, even if it was even if it didn't work out, and it sucked that it didn't work out because his heart was in the right place. Every crooked and dumb thing that he did, he did for the sake of the Clarks. You realize by the end of the damn episode, it may not have been perfect. He may, and again, like it's like the Carol thing. It, he may not have told everybody his plan, and he's not telling people now which is a whole other worry which is which is again this is why i feel conflicted about strand like like it's this weird thing where he he's asking us the audience to trust him he hasn't earned it right this is why i'm conflicted or i don't know right. no here's the thing he's earned it he had earned it but now because of what we've known about him in the last five seasons we have the wherewithal to know that okay maybe there's something going on here he's showing himself to be the old strand should i trust him shouldn't i trust him like he's you know what i mean like he he put his body in the way to save alicia i think was who was on fire i can't remember who was on fire at the diamond when they were leaving in, in episode eight I, I can't and he has that mark on his hand to prove that he that he did good you know i don't remember yeah and so and this is why i'm conflicted like you know on the one hand he 
he got Janice to get herself killed and to make, and he's so good at it that he made Janice have peace with that decision, right? So that's sick. That's disgusting. It's it's crazy. It's it's totally it's, crazy. It's gross. Ugh. Especially when at the end, you know, by the end of it, when you see her crawling away with half her body, you know, and you know, as a walker, mm -hmm. it's just so tough. Oh yeah, Sharon, he said, um, I'll say this first, Rand. He seemed to genuinely believe John. Yeah, I I agree. I think he did believe John because he knew exactly what was going on. Yeah, I yeah. think he knows. I think he has all the answers, and so he knows John is onto something. Yeah, yeah, he already knows. I mean, I think I think I think Strand might have even been the one that te to tear the page out of the armory book. I had my suspicions about that too, and I tried to get some sort of indication that he did that. Look, I. I Personally, I know that he went to Ginny afterwards saying, oh, Janice has a confession. Uh, you know, I told John to meet me at the cell, you know, because he knows John's going to go after Janice to get to the cell and blah, blah, blah. And so he knew he would be there. This is why I like Strand in a weird way, like that he knows John's movements, his behaviors, is the way he's going to do things. Um, See, I think I find that terrifying that a sociopath like that knows John's habits. That's terrifying. Well, yeah, it would be terrifying if anybody knew it. Like, it would be, <laughs> unless it's your wife, <laughs> you're supposed to know your habits. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, you live with someone but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's different but that is an indicator that how well they know each other you know in a in a good and bad way like okay this is a person who has a goods on you oh but it's your ex <laughs> or possibly exactly. possibly your ex again we we that would suck we cannot be 100 percent certain where strand lies we have our <laughs> suspicions right and and by all accounts the the show this is the bad part about knowing the sleight of hand effect the show wants you to look at strand as a dick bag <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is why I hesitate on either end of the spectrum because I know one thing for sure. I know that Strand put his body on the line, but I also know for sure that he got Janice to give give her confession, right? Mm -hmm. So these are two things that and but and like for good or for bad, look, that was a crazy thing to do, but this was also like the him putting his body on the line to st stop John from getting himself killed. That I also know. And so these are two things I wrestle with. The yin and the yang. Oh, wait, what is this? This Walking Dead World Beyond? Wait, what? Um, <laughs> all in one package named Strand. Okay, so is saying Strand is playing it smart. And Sharon is saying, and that's so unlock unlike John, right? To be hot-headed and go into things without thinking. That that makes sense. Which goes back to the toothache, lack of sleep, and the rot. Have you ever had a toothache? That will make you lose hope in life. <laughs> Uh, he knew Janice was going to mm -hmm. die. Anyway. See, that's and that's the thing. So Strand sees the writing on the wall, and Lisa says it kind of best in a weird way. Janice was marked from the beginning. Like, it, it, well, we said it. We said it after Strand and Alicia's episode. Why would he keep Janice there? Collateral damage. <laughs> See, I I think he genuinely kept her there to be the laundry service, the laundry. <laughs> Male, so we said it out loud. The laundry. Well, we said the gut instinct was because we thought I, yeah. evil. We both said it. Like, oh, I, my gut said, oh yeah, f cannon fodder. And I think, and I think we were both right. Honestly, I, I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that that Strand and Ginny had that plan right from that moment. I they were I always, always gonna throw Janice under the bus when they needed to. I didn't think that. I, I just I, thought, I, I thought it was a funny gut check when I, when I said, oh. A crack cannon fodder, but then like I thought, oh, maybe he's using it for a laundry mail service, and then we find out that's true, which is weird. And yet, see, and this so is this is, is the thing. Is Lawton the, the only place they do laundry? The answer is yes. <laughs> That's the one and only place you can do laundry. Although I wonder, like, pa Paradise Ridge has to have laundry or something like that. And again, like, I feel like Janice was marked for death I, I, <laughs> probably from the beginning. Like, any move she made. And maybe you're right. Maybe Strand knows that anything she gets Janice to do on the side could get her killed automatically. I don't know. Again, I, I can't say this or that. I really don't know. And I feel like we're going to find out at some point. But oh, We better. <laughs> yeah, but N Nisa says it clearly. It's like, you know, Strand oh. knew Janice was going to die anyway, so he made sure we Nobody else died too, you know, and that's the thing. That's that's the one thing you can credit for with Strand is that like, okay, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, and nobody else dies, you know. Everybody, everybody else gets to live, and so that's one. Everyone, th everyone who Strand decides gets to live. Right. Let's let's be real here. Let's right. let's get yeah. It is. That's it, really how it goes. It is heartbreaking because because Janice was never gonna get off scot free ever. I feel like Janice. The moment they found Janice again in Humbug's Gulch, I feel like 
they knew, I feel like everybody knew that she was marked for death because of the way she escaped the first time. And she somehow, you know, this is a weird thing. Um, Holly Kern was, was only supposed to be in two episodes and she made it to this third to have this like weird purpose, you know, which is really, really weird. And so they gave her this like this purposeful role just for this, this, this episode. So, which created this whole narrative, created a really good John episode you know, with her presence in this episode. And she got to go out in such a blaze, a blazy of glory. Okay. So, so Charity's like, first of all, she's, <laughs> Sharon, you first oh at first said, thank you thank you for making me like first of all she said to me i hate you for making me hate strand uh, making me like strand uh, and now she's saying to rachel thank you for making me hate strand again <laughs> make america hate strand again <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, like Jan Janice had always said, Ginny had always had it out for her, so she was going to die for it anyway. Sharon made sure nobody else had to die too. So Nisa says, <laughs> <laughs> "Does she mean Sherry?" Yes. Yeah. Uh, Next week, Strand throws Sherry under the swatty to save Dwight. <laughs> to honey, honey, no. <laughs> See, I would I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Strand do that at all because he decided Dwight deserves to live. I, I have a I'm I, sorry. I have a Dwight, feeling Strand ugh. is going to surprise us some more. I I mean I said that at the beginning. He's going to straddle know, some said lines. He's, he's gonna yeah. I said he's it would be more shocking to have him do something selfless, right? So right. that's almost what I'm expecting because it's so shocking. Right, right. It, it, and I was a little shocked because like. When you watch it at first, you realize, oh, I'm just trying to stop my friend from doing something stupid. No, no, no. It's not just that. He does it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it's so shocking because it, you could write it off at first. Oh, it's his friend. He doesn't want him to die. No, no, no. He's this is he's trying to stop not only him from dying because June's on her way. June might die too. Like, oh, John just died. June, sorry. <laughs> like, no, you, your your man died, and now you're going to die. Oh, wow. Sharon D says actually, if you remember, Strand was the one that was running to save Janice but couldn't make it in time. Yeah, Strand and Alicia, right? And then Wes had Wes and ended up saving her in the end. Oh in the oh yeah 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 okay fuck sharon d that is a big oh my god this is gonna oh, that actually throws an interesting wrench in that direction because we don't know what okay it kind of like the way morgan's going right now morgan himself in this episode uh, we didn't mention this but like he looks at himself in the in the rear view mirror and he goes will grace recognize me and i feel like there has will we get a moment when we look at strand in much in the way morgan sees himself where strand ha has this moment too like will i come out of this being able to look alicia in the eye and i wonder you know or maybe maybe he's oh my god i can't believe i'm gonna say this maybe john isn't the only one who can't pull himself out from the fire who can't pull himself away from the fire maybe like john like like you said about John, John was ready to die for this cause, let's say. Yeah. Strand is doubly committed to try to save his friends. And yes, that's going to create problems, but he just doesn't see that he can do what he needs to do with Alicia around, that he needs to be this person. Sorry, I'm going to make you like Strand again. <laughs> Charity in a weird way. But this is the thing about Fear of the Walking Dead that's very interesting right now in this point of time is because it is a point in time kind of thing. When we see them in four and five, they're trying to do good, trying to do good, trying to do good, not facing as many people challenges. But then when you see them in, in this in this season, they're forced to reckon with the people that they used to be and the people who they've become. And they have to become this new thing. You're dealing with somebody else now. Strand is dead. You're dealing with somebody else now. John is dead. He just pulled his tooth out, pulled the rot that was been, that's been bothering him. He knows what the problem is he doesn't need the tooth anyone anymore to remind him only thing about john is i don't know i don't know what becomes of him but i do know that with june around certain interesting things can happen from this point forward with june in the picture because it could be like it could be like a martha situation where you know Ginny may have the chess all figured out but he she's not familiar as familiar as she could be with the pieces meaning you may be thinking that this is going to be the twist in the gut with the knife for john but this could be the one thing that saves john from oblivion let's say bringing june into the picture and then bring him up again because yeah. as we've seen many times in the past with june john sometimes does feel down in the dumps and june has a way of saying no no it's fine you're good and then they do this for each other throughout these series so mm -hmm. I, i'm not ready to count john out although it does make me for all the times we felt ominous about june i wonder i wonder if we shouldn't feel more ominous about john in some ways not to kind of be down in the dumps sharon d so okay oh, yeah. sanisa so says strand wouldn't care if alicia could look him in the eye as long as alicia is alive and maybe maybe he realizes that by the end of the 
that episode. And uh, Sharon D says, June knows something is up too. And I don't think she's going to let it, let it go. And I hope she doesn't either. This is one thing that I was very, very concerned about by the end. But that no, when he sees her, that, that no hit me in the gut. Like if you missed it, watch it again. He says, no. And I, and I was like, oh. Not what, you know, not now. This is the cost. This is the cost. This is what, you know, the cost of me failing is this reward. And it's just like, I don't deserve this. You know, mm -hmm. being a ranger affords you certain privileges. <laughs> Fuck you, Jenny. I don't know what else to as say. Soon, as soon as she said that, I knew it was June coming back too. Yeah. And so suddenly too, right? Mm -hmm. Like the next day. Yeah. Yeah. And Sharon D says, every time he sees June, he'll be reminded of this. And Virginia knows she did it on purpose. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 But I did want to connect yeah. something that um, he was talking about when he was telling a story about his dad, like the, the, the real truth to Rabbi Kessner. He said something about how, you know, obviously he was talking about the two-bit mortician who thought he was do making profound statements like the end is the beginning. Ha ha ha, JK. <laughs> but um, right. something about, you know, like, like this death cult. And the one thing that got him to put the, put the death cult leader away was planting the evidence of the purse. This is something that wasn't in the letters um, that he mentioned, like almost as a confession to, to Rabbi Kessner. <laughs> A spiritual leader. And the one thing I started realizing was that John's dad and Ginny are a lot alike. John's dad had to make an example to, to get people to see which way was up. And Ginny did the same thing as, as his dad. But what I wonder is whoever is in on what Ginny was doing can't, I, and I wonder if this is going to be the case. I don't have high hopes for it. But one of the things that John said about his dad was when he did this, it cost him a lot. People were happy to see the cult leader away, but his, his colleagues could not see him the same way again. He couldn't be the same man that he could be to his wife again, John's mother, and he mm -hmm. went away. I wonder if this doesn't somehow create a ripple effect for Ginny and her fellow rangers as well, because maybe the fact that they know that she planted the evidence. Because I feel like, I don't know if you're looking at the graveyard scene really tightly, I feel like when John is talking to Dakota and I see this frame, and I might bring this up in post, is that I feel like she's showing them the earring that she's about to plant on the scene and just before it changes frames to show them dakota and john up close with the worthers and everything i feel like she shows them for that split instance the, the earring this is what shows who shows the other rangers in the background oh, oh i during the funeral i noted jenny and her right hand man were the only ones not take not taking their hats off oh and that's the a side good, eye that's a good side eye dakota was giving them that is a good one yeah and like we'll move on to dakota in a second but that is a good observation i didn't notice that i did not notice that at all so hill right the, the her I, that's what Sharon D and Nisa, yeah, th said it was Hill, and I and I was glad to finally put a, a face to the name because we've heard the name Hill, but I couldn't, I didn't know who which one he was. Like, they all look the same. <laughs> Guess who looks distinctly like a douchebag? Yeah, because <laughs> the other Marcus got killed in that last episode. Oh. That's <laughs> with the garage door. <laughs> yeah, Marcus one, Marcus two, Mark. <laughs> shit heel one, shit heel two. Oh, noted. Yeah, Rabbi calls him. Well, you're a hero, right? And then Jenny calls him a hero as well. Or no, he said your dad's a hero. Dad was a hero. And yeah. and then Jenny calls John a hero. I, but this is also before he told him about the planting the evidence thing. Or was it after? No, no, I think it was before. So one of my theories was that Dakota killed Cameron because she found out he was sharing June and John's letters with her sister. Wait, say that again. <laughs> There was a, I just didn't follow at some point. So Dakota killed Cameron because Cameron was giving Ginny access to the letters between June and John. So I agree. I'm, I'm starting to agree that Dakota could definitely be a little psycho. I'm just hoping she works her psycho magic in our favor. <laughs> right. I, I was almost, <laughs> there was something about the way Ginny shuffled Dakota along at the funeral though. Like, oh, she's been all distraught about Cameron since which she did she look distraught to you no nope not at all <laughs> he and i feel like this is evidence that was dropped in john's lap that john just didn't register oh he she he went with me cameron went with me dakota on i was with him on ranger duty ranger well like she said any like anytime dakota would leave the compound he cameron was on her ranger do, her ranger detail he was one of the rangers who escorted dakota wherever she was gonna go right so they had an attachment to her blah 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 whatever yeah so i wonder if is there maybe a relationship 
relationship there too. Like, well, and I was thinking that's how Dakota could have found out Cameron was playing spy for Ginny too, and Dakota could have taken him out so that Ginny couldn't, you know, get to those letters anymore. Of course, now that none of that, none of that really matters now. But yeah. at the time, Dakota might have been trying to help our group by taking out Cameron, and maybe, and that was her earring. <laughs> yeah. Oh, which I was looking for. I actually pre, I went on this goose chase, and this is why I was a little later <laughs> than I should have been. I actually look tried to look at the episode where we first meet her in Lawton, uh, the episode with Strand uh, and Alicia, to see if I could get those earrings in a view. But I, I just, it was too difficult. I didn't have enough time, and I don't think I would have been able to find it either. The way both Jenny and Dakota wear their hair, I don't, you don't really see their ears. Yeah, I was trying to look at Jenny's ears, and they're they're covered by their hair. I, I did, so. I did see a couple frames with her ears in full view, but like, okay, you know, just no earrings. Just couldn't make out. They were clearly earrings there, but it didn't look like. Okay. Okay. Those, they were those. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. And that's another thing. So in Laura, Sharon, he says, he tells June the reason why he moved to the cabin was because everybody was calling him a hero. So that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It's partially, yeah. It's partially what he did. You know, yeah, they called him a hero because they stopped the crime, the criminal, whatever. But he didn't mean to kill the person, you know? Right. It's not like he was, he was about to kill John, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Well, and when John leaves Jenny's office, Dakota's there. She stops him, right? And the first thing she says to him, have you ever killed anybody? Dakota, yes, that's another thing that gets me crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And he's mm -hmm. he's very frank. This is another thing that bothers me. Like, do you remember when we were talking about Morgan? How he freely talks about Dwayne and Jenny, Jenny Jones. Now, uh, yeah, and just just like where he was having trouble before. John has the same weird effect with Dakota, where like. This is something he was trying not to tell Laura at the time that, you know, what he did, you know, why he went away, and which took like several, you know, tens of whatever, 30 minutes until we finally got the story. But yeah, with Dakota, it's just like, yeah, did you kill, you ever kill anybody before? <laughs> like, right. yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I did. I didn't want to. Like, okay. That didn't take 30 minutes. It took like three seconds. Right. <laughs> well, I think, I think Dakota has a trusting face because she's so young and that's, that's going to backfire on somebody. Which is kind of, hasn't already. you know, which is, which kind of puts another tag another tally on my idea that maybe maybe Ginny and Dakota are just playing off of each other because mm -hmm. oh he's she's so distraught after Cameron died right but I'm, I'm giving a thumbs up for the for the audio listeners <laughs> Yeah, you did. You did it, Dakota. Okay, right now you can go away now. Your purpose is fulfilled. <laughs> I almost felt like, okay, Ginny was either putting on a really good show, or I felt like she was actually more upset by Cameron's death than Dakota was. Like, there were a few times Ginny actually looked legit upset about Cameron. So I don't know if, like I said, she might have just been a really good actor and like playing it for, for John, because John was watching. But um, she either orchestrated this situation, or it happened, and she decided to take advantage and and use John in a pawn, as a pawn in all of this and got him to do exactly what she wanted him to. Yeah. Yeah. And well, there's no doubt about that. So Shannon's saying, first of all, Dakota's the new Charlie, you know, <laughs> bad cop, worst cop. So there's Jenny is bad cop, Dakota's worst cop. Mm. Or I don't know, could be the, the reverse. Uh, Jenny killed Cameron because she was banging him too. <laughs> That's what, was that what you're laughing at? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like Dakota could uh, could have left. So Nisa says, I feel like Dakota could have left the earring there after killing Cameron, and then left the other at the house for Ginny to find and know it was her who killed him and make her cover for her. Yeah, or it could have been, yeah, she could have seen that it was could have. So again, like we can assume two things, one of two things, because it can't be both: that Ginny and Dakota are in cahoots, or Ginny and Dakota are playing off of each other in a bad way. Like Dakota's going her own way, being rebellious Ginny's going her own way what dakota is doing on the other side could be a whole other thing like oh is she is she in contact with the death cult and involved whatever <sighs> is she doing her own thing being a rebellious teenager like twd world beyond maybe um but you know that's undecided we don't know what that could be but but the other side is true is like okay is Ginny looking at dakota and going thumbs up you know like oh you played your part great or i'm using you for whatever and i don't care or is Ginny genuinely not again this is goes to the idea idea of making people feel safe so is jenny using dakota much in the way you know like however she wants you know just to manipulate people into f making other people think what dakota really feels mm -hmm. and so she's planting the evidence to kind of misdirect people into thinking it's janice or somebody else somebody with a bone in handle knife 38 was signed out in the page was torn the one thing that we have to automatically think about when we think about the situation is maybe posthumously again that that evidence could have been planted by the people who wanted to cover this crime up, knowing that John would find the bone 
Conan handle peace in Cameron's hand and send John onto onto a wild goose chase. But knowing at the end of all things that they would have never found the answers. The I definitely thought it was weird that John kept going through all these things and nobody was catching him, right? Like he spent hours, let's be honest, hours digging that body up and not one person saw or was like, hey, what you doing? Right. And then again, outside the gates um, with the music blaring. Nope. He, he fired his gun seven, eight times. Nobody came to find out what was going on. Whatever Ginny wants, Ginny gets. You know? Well, I, I, I got the feeling that Ginny was watching all of this. And that's why nobody came to find out what was going on, because she was already there observing. Or, or somebody, you know. Somebody being Ginny's eyes. I, I just had this really bad image of Ginny going, yeah, yeah, John, you find that corpse of Janice. Like, like masturbating Ew. to this. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you if you were Ginny? Like, oh, my plan worked perfectly. I can't wait to get home. You know, that sort of thing. Like, <laughs> like she can't get off what? if it's not like a perfectly executed plan. Okay. She gets All off right. one day a year. <laughs> I don't oh, know. God. Oh, yeah. Poor girl. Poor girl. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way she can get off, though. Ah, terrible. Anyway, so this is the sympathetic part of Ginny, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, John, find that body. Anyway, so the whole thing that I'm trying to say is that, like, even the idea that John could have found evidence in Cameron's hand is a smokescreen. The missing 38 mm -hmm. knife, smokescreen. Torn page, smokescreen. All a smokescreen. She has control of the whole... See, it's not a crime scene, or it's not a, you know, you can't find evidence in the crime if you have control over the entire crime scene or you know the whole setting yeah so this is another thing like that oh if we the audience is having tr trouble finding which way is up but when you realize that the mm -hmm. game is rigged oh wait we're trying to look at this thing also like john is looking at this thing that there's an order to these things that there's evidence that we can follow but no wait the evidence <laughs> the people that control all the evidence have control of the entire situation so there was no way john could have solved this crime ever no no he 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 couldn't have but he was gonna try and and in and and, and every i feel like every step you know people were getting in his way too uh or Yes. Well, Strand. Yes, but also, the, but he was the only person to get in his way. Like you said before, nobody stopped him from digging the grave. Nobody stopped right. him from going after Janice. J the only thing that I will give you about Strand is that he Strand tells him to think about it. And in that time, they probably, he, this was his moment to go to Janice. Janice, hey, John is going to do something very, very stupid to get you <laughs> out of here. And it's going to get both of you killed down the road because they're going to know about it and find it, find you guys out, know where you're going to go because Cameron spilled the beans. This is J Strand's way of saying Str Cameron spilled the beans about both of you. So you know what's up. You can't leave. They're going to find you. They're going to know where to go. And not only are you going to get yourself killed, you're going to get John killed in the process because he's going to want to ferry you away. He's not going to go with you. He's going to stay here and do what's right for this town like an idiot. And so Strand is the only one to get in his way. Goes for Cam's body. Goes to, to, to Janice's execution. Nobody's stopping him. Nobody's stopping him from killing these walkers. Nobody's stopping him from doing anything. They have control over the entire situation they control john from the start because of the letters that that i'm glad you said that just now because for the life of me i all three times i watched it i'm screaming at janice trying to understand what is the point of your confession what is that gonna what is that gonna do except make everything worse but yeah, now that you explain it that way, if Strand had put it to her that way, she would have confessed to save John. That was the only way to put it to her, you know, like... Yeah, she, that's the only thing that makes sense. You know what's really crazy? It's something John says in this episode, and he says, you're the... He says this in the beginning when he's trying to figure out what's what. He goes, the last thing he says before Janice is being accused, he says, you're the closest thing I've got to family. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm reviewing this episode, that, like, broke me a little bit. It's like, is that true? Oh, my God. Is that true? I mean, isn't Strand technically stationed? there no he's he's in he's part of this inter community council so he goes from he travels so, so he doesn't belong anywhere he doesn't belong anywhere he just keeps going from from where does he hang his hat everywhere apparently sounds like <laughs> he comes back he to just... report to jenny but he keeps go he keeps on moving he's part of the inter inter oh, inter settlement I council looked at my notes i think in like an hour <sighs> strand's always got to do something to make me not hate him because it, it can't be that easy right it can't be that I just, easy i feel like even even when strand does something that seems selfless you know later down the road we're gonna be like oh oh that's why you did that oh 
okay, now that makes sense. You know what? And it's so funny because when you say that, there's so many things that remind me of Negan. Two things in particular. That, Another person not to trust. That well, yeah, but that shouted alarm, but <laughs> alarm bells at me. One when John mentions, oh, June's like she knows medicine, so she's safe. But then I remember, oh, you mm. killed two doctors or three doctors. Doctor Carson's. <laughs> you killed two Doctor Carson's, and then oh, wait, hold on. Well, he threw- well the one before Doctor Carson, right? Yeah, the one before Doctor Carson, then Doctor yeah. Carson in the fire, and then the brother Doctor <laughs> Carson uh, at the uh, CB radio station place where the Jew. Eugene finds the CB radio. Uh, yeah. With Father oh, yeah, Gabriel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Father Gabriel finds it with Dr. Carson, and he's going blind and all that stuff, okay? Yes, yes. <laughs> so... But that's the thing. He's not like he can't not kill the doctor because it's and h- how is he different from Virgin Negan? Okay, not much. But like not she's much. playing the game on a whole other level. And I had to say that sort of like Negan. <laughs> but yeah. then, but then I thought in relation to Strand because if you remember something about the way Strand took out Hilltop, he the Hilltop scouts, he hung by the tree so that they would know that it was him and to prepare themselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, messy way of doing it, but Negan be. Negan. Neganing, but that whole idea of like, okay, Negan isn't one to, and maybe the same as Carol, like you mentioned it before, like Carol will sometimes do and pull an Otis in order to save everybody else. I'm not. Why? Why do I? Why am I okay with Carol doing that? I don't That's know. Fair. I'm even giving <laughs> Carol credit. Be like, no, she doesn't mean to do it. She's like an accident, you know. Like she doesn't mean to, you know, like me or anyone in the past. You know, past is the past, right? Yeah. I guess. I guess I. See I see Carol as a selfless character. Right. Strand is out for himself. I think that's why I can justify it. But that's that's what makes him super Strand 3, is that like <laughs> he becomes a Negan Carol, kind of this weird combination of, I'm not afraid to Otis a couple people. I love how Otis is like a verb now. <laughs> Right. <laughs> to Otis a few people. I'm afraid to Otis oh a cu- couple people if my people are, or if most people are safe. You're like, or key people, like you said. The people he safe. chooses are right. safe, yeah. <laughs> But for but for the see God help you if you're not on Strand's good list. <laughs> <laughs> wow, who would have ever thought that we would ever say that about Strand though, right? In a weird way, like oh, Strand is the person I'm supposed to be worried about. <laughs> like, like, no, I I thought that right from the beginning. Like, from the beginning, yes. But like at a certain point, you're like, oh, well, you're not that man. It, like if you're on his good side, you're on his good side. You are protected, right. sort of. Yeah. Like after season until four, you, <laughs> until you until you don't benefit him anymore. From season four to about season six, you know you. You were great. You know, you're on Strand's good side. You might even be his boyfriend, Cole. Anyway, since I, <laughs> would it be fair to say that in a weird way, like one could say this episode was better than all the others, but also like the hardest? Oh yeah, on us. Because in a weird way, like everybody gets like an evolution in a weird way. I mean, Althea doesn't. The Althea episode reads a lot more like you can't always get what you want, but you just you might find you get what you need. <laughs> That's what yeah. I think. And then like Strand's episode is like kind of the same in a weird way. Can't always get what you want. But you just might find you get what you need. Uh, and then Morgan is kind of the same way too. But then with John, it's just like, oh, you get what you want, but you don't get what you need. I feel like this is another reason for like people who hated seasons four <laughs> and five to almost celebrate that like things aren't always going to go the way we think it's going to go. Yeah. Sharon is saying every, everybody else evolved in a positive way, kind of. And John has definitely evolved in a negative way. Now, see, saying, like, I'm thinking about Strand and Morgan, I suppose, specifically. I don't know if I would call that a positive evolution, though. I mean, necessary, probably, but... I don't I don't know if it I don't know if I would call it a positive evolution. Wait, you hit on something that ties them all together. Necessary. <laughs> mm-hmm. The yeah, one thing yes. that ties all these evolutions, even John's, is he needs to see which way is up. Yeah. And it was a hard fraught run too. So it wouldn't be an evolution necessarily, but maybe it is. Maybe John is getting orientation. He's being more oriented. Of a, more of a, a realization which yeah. way's up. Yeah, exactly. And the, it, well and he needs to know what his starting point is now because now he's like the end is the beginning for him <laughs> it's true though it's this weird Candace's thing where the end is his beginning yeah, yeah. oh god heartbreaking why don't we go now that we you, you brought that up because you hear the the song that plays that they that Ginny chooses to play for janice who sings the it the artist and- is um sorry i'm just seeing all of my spelling mistakes because i was trying to type so fast <laughs> i do that all the time 
<laughs> and I really try hard, but sometimes I don't win. It's a song by Myrna Rowlands. Myrna Rowlands. Rowland. Mm. Sorry. I put an S on there, but I don't think there is. <laughs> um, song's called As Long As I Have You. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. It, it, and then in parentheses, it said the Al Hazan demo. Oh, yeah. Al Hazan. Al Hazan demo. Is that, okay. That's a person. Yeah, is it a demo a for him? I was confused about that. Al, Al Hazen made the demo. Well, actually, isn't he? It sounds like he's. Is he? He the one singing in this one? I thought it kind of sounded like a lower register female. And then I, so. I thought it sounded like a higher register male. <laughs> But honestly, I, it could it could be either way. It, yeah, Sharon, it, but I know it wasn't the original. Actually, Sharon, I have saying the original it was, pulled up. Sharon, Sharon was saying it was also used in an episode of Better Call Saul too. Yeah, when I was trying to find out more information about the song, that the episode of Better Call Saul came up. And I was like, oh yeah, Sharon, they mentioned that. And what's interesting about that is it sounds like it's somewhat in the same context. Like, yeah. as, as long so as I, I have you. So it, it sounds like, and this Ooh. happens a oh, lot, by oh. the way. Like, uh, what's her name? Diane Warren writes songs for like Rod Stewart and all these other, all these other artists, right? She sung them herself. She has sold those songs off to other artists to sing like Rod Stewart that I know for sure. And, the, and the, she's even licensed those songs off to other artists later on in soundtracks and stuff like that. So mm. it's not not uncommon for that sort of thing to happen where a songwriter will just go oh here take this oh al hazen <laughs> take this as your demo and you gotcha. know, and you sing it too you know so i'll license this to you as a songwriter mm -hmm. Wh which one do you think sounds the more apropos though or sounds more fitting for the scene though um the one that they used i mean that I think dark so too. deep register was more haunting right yeah right especially considering what was going on what was what he was walking into and and the lyrics i mean really hit Dark. home here too oh yeah it starts off and says and if my dreams never do come true and every plan that i've made falls through <laughs> i mean that's I, john I right there you. right yeah <laughs> Right. I won't care. I won't cry. If you're there, I'll get by. I won't care as long, as long as I have you. Yeah. Yeah. June. <laughs> June. Yeah. And if the sky sh should shatter and fall and tumble down to the sea, you just, just let it fall. No, it won't matter at all. If you, if you still, if you still believe in me. So if the oceans all turn to sand, just as long as our love will stand, I won't care. I won't cry. If you're there, I'll get by. I'll get by. That's the key phrase. Yeah. Right. And I like what Sharon is saying is how like, uh, there's an irony to it because you could say that, yeah, as long as June is there, I'll get by. But mm -hmm. what Sharon says in the theme of you can't always get what you want, which I said earlier, John got June, but she's now a reminder of everything that just happened. Even if it's subconsciously, that will always be there so that Ginny put a stain on their relationship that can't be removed is his beginning heartbreak. Right. His is heartbreaking beginning again with june so yeah. and this is really the beginning of their marriage too right i mean yeah. they got married and then immediately were separated so this is them coming back together as husband and wife for the first time too right right and, and you know in a weird way in a weird 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 way though this is this is kind of like a mirror of what he went through but also what june went through like what he went through when he shot that the whatever the criminal that was running away having stolen something and then he shot him and it accidentally killed him he zigged when he should have zagged that sort of thing oh. he went away for that and so this is kind of like another thing where he went through this process where he didn't realize that it was going to lead in this direction but it was going to be this in this direction this entire time that janice was definitely going to get killed one way or the other and that maybe even quite possibly he accidentally put her in harm's way by pursuing this case that he could have just left alone Ginny basically manufactured the scenario in with which he could recreate that again but I said June too because when June stumbles onto John's cabin or in the back of his cabin or whatever floats up on his shores it's mm -hmm. in under similar uh, like inauspicious circumstances where she was trying was she at that point was she trying to get back to her no she wasn't trying to get back to her daughter uh, with the with the antibiotics she was already dead I think right I think so yeah and, yeah and so this is after having similarly just tried to do everything she could to save her and yet she couldn't and she had to leave so there's the same thing going on where because she covered up her daughter's illness she ended up dying and it ended up killing everybody in the fema camp because she turned and then all the things happened 
And so there's like a similar, there's, there's all, there is a bit of a similarity going on there. Like, you know, I was doing it for the right reasons, but it ended up going all wrong. You know, John yeah. stopped the criminal for all the right reasons, but ended up going all wrong. And John pursued the truth no matter what. And it ended up being the very thing that got Janice killed in the end. And again, all being set up and orchestrated by Ginny, this cult leader. <laughs> Let's just say. Yeah. So it's funny. Charity says it sounded like a song from the era where his dad was looking for the serial killer. Yeah, quite possibly. Like in the oh. 80s. Was it 80s or it wasn't in the 80s that he said it was happening or was it the 70s? I don't know if he gave us Probably a time 70s. frame. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would, I would, I was picturing the 70s just based on John's age and how old his dad must have been <laughs> and when he was active. So I, uh, a lot of yeah. inferring there. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would make more sense. Yeah. <laughs> when he was knee high. <laughs> Yeah, when he was knee high, that's right. Not not too yeah. old, right? Good good call, Nisa. I, I wrote down my Jewish lesson about staka. I did look up the literal. See, the thing is with sadaka, sadaka is the act of giving. It's charity, actually, literally. Rabbi Kessner does mention this, but the literal translation of staka is righteousness, which I found very interesting because I'd never heard of staka being used in that context. But but then I realized what the different levels of staka. It's like not just giving to the poor. There's there's eight rungs, and of those eight rungs, there's like giving. When the person's asking, given when the person isn't asking, but you give them anyway, giving to the person when it doesn't, when they don't know that you're giving it to them. There's, there's levels to the levels of righteousness when you give, you know, all the way down to the, even the bottom rung, which is still applica applicable, which is like giving, but not enough. <laughs> is still stuck up, you know, but it still applies, but it's not that great. But I, I like the the relation of this with Rabbi Kessner and John, because I feel like Rabbi Kessner is like this avatar, you know, because when I look at Strand and, and Rabbi Kessner, I feel like there's there's what John should know, and that's Strand, in a sense. Like, Strand knows what's going, what's up, you know, knows okay, yeah. up from down. Rabbi Kessner's still operating within the system, and maybe has an idea of what's up and down, but still believes in righteousness, maybe, you know? And he maybe is even like the Dwight in this episode, encouraging John to, to press on and do what's good, you know? Until the end when he realizes there's nothing to do. Or And he even says at the end, like, maybe there's another way. Maybe there's another way. We did this before. We were able to redirect before. Why can't we do it again? Oh, because Ginny is in control of the chessboard. So in the end, it's really weird how the show almost, which is why it's so jarring, the show is almost forcing us to see things Strand's way, even though it's a hard pill to swallow. It it is. It's very difficult. I feel very awful, like admitting to this fact because I I feel like the more we go on with this this show, every episode further and further, we're gonna see Strand's point of view, and we're gonna see how <laughs> right Strand was. I don't care. Right, I get it. I mean, I'm where you're at, but I have the unfortunate predisposition of having to fucking defend this guy. So I was about to say it, <laughs> but I do. I, I can't. I can't. It's like last week when I said, "Oh, we're gonna have, we're gonna be forced to at some point, maybe possibly see June. June might die because it fits Jenny's narrative." Blah blah blah. Okay. Charity's you. gonna light you up. You better watch it. <laughs> Well, now I'm thinking, like, if John doesn't really see what's up, like, he's on the chopping block. I hate it. I hate everything. I hate the show for making me like it. Oh, like Strand. <laughs> <sighs> Sharon, he's like, stop. And he says, like, ha, 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 ha. These are, the, these are my two avatars right now. <laughs> Charity. <laughs> Charity's like the good avatar. Nisa's is like my favorite avatar. I mean, sorry, but they're my bad avatar. Oh no, am I strand? I'm having an identity crisis. Uh, that's why I like you guys a lot. I, I, look, I have things, but I don't want to talk about them anymore. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything left to say. I'm going crazy. Um, I, the only thing I have left to say was my little, my fun little tidbit that isn't really about the episode, but Garrett. <laughs> so in the very beginning, we see John Dory writing a letter to June. Did you happen to know what hand he was writing with? Was it the right hand? His or left. Was he, left was he a lefty? Garrett, okay. Dill Garrett Dillahunt is a lefty, but John Dory is a righty. It, when he's writing the know, letter, is he... and I know that because when I met Garrett, he signed this picture for me, and he told me a little story. So John Dory is holding his gun in his right hand, and he's doing a little flip, right? But if you look over here, Garrett Dillahunt's left hand is guiding his right hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he's like mimicking the movements? Yeah. Yep. Look at look at this hand. This hand is going through the motion so that this hand can pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> this came from D Garrett Dillahunt himself. He he told me that story about that picture. So when I saw him writing the letter to June in the beginning, left-handed, 
I, I noticed it immediately. And then later when he goes out to shoot the walkers that are eating Janice, he shoots with his right hand. Oh, wow. And Garrett is a left-handed person. Just so. Correct. Correct. Well, uh, we see him be ambidextrous on the show before too, though. Yes. The guns. <laughs> pew, 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 mm -hmm. pew, pew. Yeah. And a lot of that is, by the way, if you had, and I mentioned this the year of, but like, I think uh, season four, he had, he and even Jenna Elfman trained at Terran Tactical, by the way. Very cool. So you, you got to see a cool display of him actually shooting some of these guns. Not the not the two the pea shooters, but like the uh, like a I think it was like a shotgun actually, and a couple of oh, rifles. Nice. Yeah. This is one of the critiques we had of season eight of The Walking Dead was a distinct difference in using practical versus CG. Like mm. season eight did away <laughs> with some some of the practical, so it looked like spray and pray. You know, it looked kind of fake. But yeah. like when we reach when we got into season four, we can tell there was a distinct recoil. There was like a like a feeling that they were shooting something and then mm -hmm. you then we saw the behind the scenes to that so if you go to Terran tactical's page from two years ago you'll see the training session he did fucking fantastic by the way it was really <laughs> badass <laughs> yeah and charity says it jenna was badass with that winchester yeah and it's based on real training too so i want to read what charity says just because it's cool <laughs> first of all nisa says i'm stranded and i can accept it this was during our little break <laughs> but, <laughs> but charity says i knew we were going to get heartbreak with john and june but i expected expected a death or something worse. I didn't expect Virginia mm. to taint their relationship. Yeah. Which is, again, almost this is worse. A, yeah, she right? says it's almost more heartbreaking somehow. Yeah. And, yep. And doesn't that go to the weird, again, what we know is a drop. What we don't is an ocean. The sleight of hand mm -hmm. effect is real. And that's amazing. I mean, every, I feel like we have to always touch up on this every single time, not just with Fear the Walking Dead. We've said this about the Walking Dead, not knowing what's going to happen and how that's great. They lead us <clears> down <throat> a garden path only to knowing know that we they're we're not they're gonna throw something in our direction that is acceptable like we'll accept it and yeah. and it's something we're not gonna see which is hard it's hard because because when you see it you're like oh why didn't i think of that first but then you realize oh but they were leading down us down a specific path with specific binary choices or however many choices to have and yet we see the outcome of this episode i mean i had a feeling that it wasn't going to be death like do you remember what i said in the last episode because this is me trying this is me trying <laughs> i said in the last episode oh they're gonna make they're gonna tell john that june is dead but she's not you oh, know like this is yeah you know what i mean like this is me trying to figure out what's the way they're gonna throw it to this week but i somehow can never figure it out and again it's not it's not to figure it out it's just to just try and have fun that's the thing i almost see now in talking about that and maybe i'm wrong and tell me if i'm wrong please but i almost think it would have been even crazier if the knife was his that was used to kill cameron was john's it, knife? it was john's knife yeah it would it would have been crazier had they have used john's knife to do the dirty mm -hmm. right it would have in some way tied it together yeah. a little bit easier but i can see why they didn't do it only because the point is not to implicate john the point is to confuse john to have him keep going to keep finding the truth to keep pushing keep trying to do it and to almost find an unfindable killer you know and in the meantime you know the real killer gets executed you know and that sort of thing like they don't want him to lose his sense of right and wrong they just want them him to know what which way is up like when to give up and when not to give up they're gonna point in a certain direction and tell john it's up and he needs to believe it yeah and maybe they need him for law and order maybe they need him to occasionally you know solve a real crime but at the end of the day whatever jenny wants <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah. I um, I did write down one line from Jenny's speech, and it was, um, Cameron's murder was a test for all of us. Now, I don't think that's true. I think it was only a test for John. <laughs> and he passed according to Ginny. She he, did, he, did, he passed he did exactly. the way Ginny wanted him. Yeah. Yes, he did exactly what Ginny wanted him to. Yeah. I mean, you could say, hmm, you could say <laughs> this was an episode, like a John-centric episode. But at the end of the day, this was showing how this is a Ginny-centric episode in a weird way yeah jenny is a master I chess hate, player i hate saying that i really do like even i'm saying i hate saying that now I don't, I don't mind how clever she is because I think it's going to backfire in a catastrophic way on her. So right. go ahead. But, she can think she's smart. But you know, man. But like someone's going to be smarter. We thought that about about Negan too. Do you remember like all the way back in season six, seven? And we were like, who's this Negan guy? Oh, they'll figure it out. Blah, and we did not figure it out. <laughs> right. 
I mean, do you think Everybody's back? Everybody's naked. Think, think back, right? Think back to how you felt. Like, oh, they'll figure this out. They'll overcome. And it's like, no, they never really did. And and it's like two and a half, so maybe three seasons. Yeah. And you know, you keep I, going at, at it the same way. And I had comic book knowledge though, so I, <laughs> that that situation wasn't totally fair for me. Right. <laughs> I did you, know who Negan was. But can you imagine how how bad it was for us? Thinking, oh, they'll yeah. get it. They'll figure it. Oh no, they will not. <laughs> And so there's Not there's a too late. yeah yeah and so that's it's so interesting to like almost have this knowledge maybe as a front loaded knowledge sort of thing like oh don't don't be too sure who's going to defeat who and this is why I say this is because and again this is why I have to mention what I mentioned the last episode which was you know it may be and by the way because of the events of this episode Morgan's interaction with spray paint guy and the other guy who happened to get killed in this episode now it makes me wonder because they don't know about Ginny at all so now it puts me back on track with the knowledge that we have that Ginny is after Morgan ultimately with this army that Ginny is forming of which John may end up being a part of mm. and uh, you passed Cameron's test brings us back to this point which is in order to maintain this privilege of having Jenna of uh, Jenna oh my god having June in his life <laughs> Is he even aware up from down enough to, to make the right choice about going after Morgan or not? Is he going to be forced to be put in the same situation as Strand was and say, yeah, this is about this is about saving June now, you know, keeping June safe. It means Morgan has to go, you know, will, will he, right? This is what I'm saying. Like, this is how you make a, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to say yes or no. But again, the question is the thing that makes us go, makes our skin shiver because Ginny's in a perfect position to like possibly make that happen mm -hmm. this is the whole purpose this is the same thing she did with strand like i'm wondering who's fooling who with strand and jenny jenny still you know what i mean yeah i want to think that strand's playing jenny you know he's getting close he's playing he's being negan when he joined the whispers right yeah that, that's what i want to believe i really do it's strand so i just don't know yeah and and, and you know who's playing again like like nisa says they're playing <laughs> each other it, which is maybe jenny's plan like oh i'm gonna keep him thinking that he can make plans and God laughs. But as we find out, him appointing Janice, just on the face value of it, him appointing Janice to laundry duty was his way of trying to do that. And then when he finds out, he quickly squirrels away and, you know, obviously has to fall back and think of another plan. You know, he, he can't be the one to be found out. And I think Janice even knows that too. Like, okay, you know, you did what you did to try to get, give me some purpose and whatever. But, you know, at the end of the day, it didn't work out. And well, here we are. And I'm not, and again, this goes to what John says, you're the only family I have around here here you know and then it kind of goes to what Janice says, like, you know, without Strand, without you, without the rest of this gang, I really don't have anything. And so I'm not willing to risk my life to get Strand in trouble and you in trouble. You know, you two people who were there for me. So I don't know. Yeah, this is going to be tough. And Strand, just like Sharon D says, she's putting them all through boot camp and setting them straight in her own way. So I, I don't know. <sighs> Which is also cool that there's a Morgan threat throughout these episodes, too. Because I wonder if they're, they're going to recognize how awful goodness is. I, I, I'm plucking a line from the crow. Do you remember that with that that one dude near the end? His line throughout this, he he keeps reciting. Bash the devil stood. I feel how awful goodness. I feel how awful goodness. Like Morgan looking at his reflection and saying, I don't know if they'll recognize me, but we feel like he's on a good path and he's yeah. going to try to bring them to somewhere good. But is everybody else going to be in a position to be able to accept that? That's what is crazy. It's like we're watching, it's like that math problem. We're watching two freight trains, you know, uh, <laughs> like, like hit each other. Where will they impact? How will they impact? And Jenny says, it's like, he, she's like the cult leader in the desert brainwashing everybody. One other thing that kind of gave me pause and I wanted to know your opinion on so after Ginny pins the key onto, not Garrett, J John. <laughs> yeah, I see you um, keep doing that. He looks out um, and he makes eye contact with Dakota. What did you What did you read on her face? Uh, well, what did you read? Because I didn't pay too much attention to that. I felt like she felt I, disappointed or like like not that's disappointed. That's exactly what I. That's exactly what I wrote down. Is she disappointed, disappointed in herself? Little? I see sadness on her face. Is she sad because she sees the torment that John's going through because she knows he was trying to find the truth and obviously it didn't pan out because he's being pinned as a hero. So is she sad for that? Is she disappointed that he never found out the truth? If this was her all along, did she want to be discovered? That was another thought I had. Like when she said she's covering mm. for someone. 
I it almost felt like Dakota wanted to be caught. Found out, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it didn't like if, turn if out. What we're assuming is true. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Je Ginny wasn't going to let Dakota be found out, and <sighs> or you know, maybe like let's let's play the side of the angels on this one because this is what I. <laughs> have to do even if i steer you down another path later on you know let's assume for a second that you know dakota is in the same spot as john is maybe dakota is a representation of seasons four and five all that is good in youth you know that sort of thing even though youth and the apocalypse are awful except for dakota apparently yeah. you know because she helps charlie out she saves her life uh she tries to get the gang to get this weapon thing and to get them you know i want my freedom blah 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 let's go with that seeing the parallel of dakota both dakota and john trying to find the truth and then them both realizing that the journey itself from what they knew uh, ultimately in the end janice was never going to survive but the idea that possibly it could it could have affected any outcome probably got them both disappointed like that for one second we could believe that justice and righteousness could have won the day like the rabbi says at the funeral yeah yeah Do you know what i mean like they're, they're almost you know what who said it in the episode oh my god it's not in this episode but it's something that hope says it's like i'm almost disappointed in myself that I thought for one second you could be my brother. And this happens to mm -hmm. us a lot. A lot of the times when we're upset with other people, we're mostly upset at ourselves for giving other people a chance. Usually, right? Yeah. Oh, John Dory has a killer line too, right after he kicks the shit out of Strand and he's screaming, Janice was right. This place destroys everything. And I wrote, he doesn't even know how right he is yet. Yeah, we don't even know how right he right. is yet, really. <laughs> yeah, as soon as June shows up, I mean, that place destroyed everything. Everything. Yeah. Ah, oh, man, how awful goodness is. Oh, God. Which immediately made me think of the, the the rotting tooth in his mouth, too. And the worst part about it is, going back to what I was trying to say before, <laughs> was that <laughs> the worst part about it is he's more disappointed in himself. It's true. He could have seen what up was down right from the jump, right from when they captured him and separated him in June. Right? Think about it. Like, he should have known up from down from the very beginning. But he gave it a chance. And maybe, because th this goes to kind of what Strand did. He's like, maybe we should hear her out in season five. Maybe, remember what he said um, when Virginia was oh, yeah. calling him to dinner? He was the one who suggested that, huh? Yeah. And uh, oddly enough, John is the one who gives it a try, you know? Strand was not down with it from the very start. Kicking shit into Ranger's feet and that sort of thing. <laughs> Kicking the, the planter's peanut guy <laughs> without, without <laughs> arms, arms and legs. But that's the thing, like cool. the weird role reversal, right? Like of, of him going, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe this is someplace we can live in safety and harmony and justice and staka or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, we want to give people the benefit of the doubt. But like when, when you can't feel the rot in your own mouth and you can't see it all around you, that the game is rigged, you know? And I feel bad. See, this, the thing is that the reason why I keep referring back to those people who criticize seasons four and five is that these are the, this is the perfect episode for them because, you know, with all the goodness and, and trying to do right and making the po impossible possible, this is a perfect episode for them because this is a perfect representation of taking all those feelings and subverting them. Like saying, okay, this is the byproduct and this is why it can't work anymore. This is why your armor doesn't work anymore. And I, I love it on a narrative level. It is crushing to watch. It is crushing to watch, but it's genius. Genius. I will admit, this episode is fraught with genius. Awesome, excellent decisions to make all throughout the way. The, the goose chase, the tying it in with the dad, and then using that and making that the entire raison d'etre for this episode is like, this is all about you. And it's going to be because of you. And you're, you're going to have, at the end of the day, you're going to have nobody to blame for yourself for not seeing it in the first place. I mean, you could even say like, John, you're a shit cop, you know, because <laughs> you, you couldn't see the, the forest for the trees for this one. Well, he was probably still thinking, you know, old world ways. How oh, things I wrote that down. Should, should work, not how they do work, but how it should work. Right. And how weird it is that that can change. The idea of up versus down can change situationally. Yeah. Can yeah. be dangerous, too. I mean, if he starts giving into the to the direction that they're pointing and saying that's up, it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, that that's up, this is down, but don't believe it. I guess, like in the back of your mind, you you still need to know what's true. Right, you need to know the rules, <laughs> like something like yeah. John says before. Like you, you know, and it's like it's like you think the rules are physics, like they're always going to be the same, but they're not. You know, physics here changes. Sherry also says someone and talking about people on Reddit with comments. Uh, someone mm -hmm. compared Dwight and Sherry's reunion to John and June, saying it was 
because you know john and james was flat but the point that's the whole point you know and it's good to compare the last episode with this episode how they though both reunions came at the end of the episodes you know mm -hmm. but it's supposed to be flat because it's not a joyous reunion really so both of them get a reunion but one is not cracked up and hell for all we know you know maybe dwight and sherry's reunion is short-lived too I was just thinking that we don't really know yet if Sherry and Dwight reuniting is necessarily a good thing yet. Yeah, and maybe the past is dead. Man, I'm getting depressed. Ugh. This show better take an upswing pretty quick here, because uh, <laughs> we're not going to make it to Christmas, I don't think. Or not. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, look, I could, listen, I, this is me saying, this is all I'm going to say about how I feel about the season so far, is that I know I can take more. I don't know how much I can take, but I know yeah. I can take more because it is good writing. It is just really good writing to to the to putting it on screen, to editing, to cinematography. Clearly, because of the dark mirror comparisons and the green that I spotted out, like it's when it dawns on you, it's like oh, there's poison running throughout this episode. Does Sharon D says Janice did say the season would be dark? I don't think Jenna pr quite prepared us for how dark. <laughs> and I don't. Yeah, I don't think she could. <laughs> Well, no, like no, some but, but. And, you, and can you blame them because sometimes somebody says something is going to be one way but it's not enough of that way and this is a whole other darkness than i even anticipated it would be like when you say dark i think oh cinematically oh my god and you know what just occurred to me like mm -hmm. do you remember how I was, I was describing in the look ahead those disgusting zombies did you catch that yeah. that look ahead also by the way no. oh please do because <laughs> once you look at that you're realizing oh god it gets worse from here like who gets <laughs> who has to face off against those things oh my right. god the demon walkers <laughs> oh yeah oh god yeah those guys <laughs> this is how dark it gets thank you good night <laughs> None of the Walking Dead universe shows are like any other show on TV. Not any shows that I watch anywhere where each episode, you know, has the beginning, the the problem, the resolution, the ending. Like you, everything is, you know, nicely tied up. We have a beginning, a middle, an end, and you feel good at the end of every episode because, you know, they caught the bad guy or whatever. I watch a lot of crime yeah. shows. But you know, The Walking Dead, it's not like that. I mean, you could watch a whole episode and feel more empty at the end of the episode than you did starting it. <laughs> uh, feel my empty soul, Walking Dead. Ooh, feel the Walking Dead. Yeah. And 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 that's, you know, due to the writing. But it's it's like you don't you can't always count on this happy ending. You can't you might not feel good at the end of every episode. And I, I need to start feeling good a little bit. <laughs> well, here's here's the thing here this is something i haven't talked about in a very very long time but we talked about in season eight when we covered it the game theory effect it's that monkey pulling that slot machine man you keep thinking something good's gonna come and occasionally maybe you get do get oh a couple cherries what does that mean oh i get my bid back okay well i'll keep pulling i'll win someday but like right. we find that the monkey ends up pulling the thing more often when it doesn't lose than when it does actually win because once it actually wins a couple times it can walk away but if it pulls and it keeps pulling hoping for a big win it'll keep pulling and that's the season right now that's the right. this, listen you realize i said this about season eight because at some point <laughs> we have to win at some point because ah so many seasons of us losing that's what i'm saying i mean we ne i need yeah. i need at some point for everybody to get back together so we can fight the bad guy together you know oh boy listen i know it's not gonna uh, happen for a long yeah. long long time i'm i'm not but i'm not hopeful. going anywhere either i'm not like, going yeah. anywhere i'm not gonna i'm not gonna not watch the show because they're not giving me what i want that's not that's not what's happening i'm yeah. just gonna continue to cry and bitch and moan about it <laughs> yeah and, Sh and sharon is invoking her one uh, obligatory game of thrones reference <laughs> uh, her quote is if you think this has a happy ending then you haven't been paying attention <laughs> <laughs> I do want to actually mention one thing. I'm going to call it Maddie's Corner. My friend Matt, as I mentioned last episode and maybe the episode before, and has been catching up on Fear the Walking Dead. He loves it. He's up to season four and he actually kind of likes it. He really, really likes seasons one through three. And he, I'm wow. utterly, I'm utterly amazed that he's taking to it. He he watched The Walking Dead, wasn't really all about it, tuned out after whatever, whatever season it was. But now he's watching Fear the Walking Dead and there is something about Fear the Walking Dead that is very attractive. Initially, the character 
characters are a lot more grounded. You know, they're more realistic. The situations are a lot more swallowable, right? Like, like what was it? Snuggleable, <laughs> swallowable. But see, the thing is, is what's interesting about him binging the show is that yes, season four was jarring, but he kept going and he found that he actually kind of liked it still. You know, which is weird. Well, and, season four I did, was the best. Then. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing: like, y- the, you can recognize the divide in the fans. She's he he actually literally said, "What the fuck am I watching?" With when season four started but he said i'll keep going yeah he literally (laughs) said that and then he goes uh, because he recognized the cartoonization of people the action figureization like the archetype archetypicalization that's typical of the walking dead which i helped him through like a sherpa but then i said listen there are a couple key episodes that i want you to watch i want you to watch definitely laura which he loved and uh he liked and i told him like you may not like close your eyes completely but cinematically it's genius and, and he agreed and so we've yeah. got him we've got him through season four and now we just got to get him through season five so maybe hopefully next update he's blasting through this thing man he did this in like you know a little over a week all four Dang. seasons yeah holy crap it doesn't take that long by the way but still That's a lot. yeah <laughs> i love how sharon you follow up and she said back before every character was madison <laughs> right He's not up to the season five yet, where every character is Madison, by the way. So, <laughs> but I feel like I'm going to update you guys next time about Matt's progress in a separate segment called Matt called Maddie's prog- progress. <laughs> oh, he's up to season five and he hates it. He got up to beer bottle balloon. He said, fuck this shit. I'm kidding. Right. I, I'm very curious now because it, he, this is the thing. This is why I'm so curious because he really actually liked episode eight, the mid season finale of season four. And that really took me for a loop because not a lot of people did. Which one was it? What episode that was, was it? That, that was Madison's death episode, you know? Oh, uh, <laughs> but like, but like he really liked how that went down. And that really, I'm not often surprised in that way. What I mean is there are expected reactions I get out of that episode. Usually that it, not a lot of people liked it, first of all, because they either liked it because they either didn't like it because Madison died or they, they didn't like it because the people who wanted her to die wanted to know how, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and all, and also found it like, like why, because they hate that character and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, why spend so much time on that character? It's kind of like the Carl death in a way. They kind of slow mo her death in a weird way and it took too long and whatever well, well carl's was we over were, a couple episodes yeah and we were i mean you know madison was technically the you know a main character so she needed to go out with style i guess yeah kind of like maybe rick's way of leaving the show too because you know in a weird way i mean he wasn't didn't he leave wait, season eight season nine yeah yeah wow weird okay yeah, in a weird way they did madison like they did rick like they just de-emphasized the show to a point where main characters are not main characters anymore and then they can leave the show oh yeah. that sucks I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> no, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, let's move on. Look, again, I'm going to take you back to the beginning of this episode when I kind of groaned. Um, because it's it's like, you know, it's two hours and 45 minutes later on the unedited version of this podcast. <laughs> and now if you want the unedited version of this podcast, and trust me, this episode's going to be cut to shit. <laughs> <laughs> Which means there's some good things in the cuts. <laughs> Buy us a coffee. Head over to ko-fi.com slash squawking dead to support the podcast primarily. But you get something out of it. You can get the unedited episodes for 30 days if you buy us one coffee. If you subscribe to a coffee, the party keeps on rolling. On top of getting the unedited episodes, you also get a chance to be with us in the chat, just like Sharon and Issa were, uh, which means you can lend your insights and steer us in different directions than we expected we would be steered into. You would do that, because we are squawking dead. And if you don't want to jump directly into the deep end, you also have the option to pay what you want for these unedited episodes, too. And if you happen to be spending $3 buying these unedited episodes, you'll still get access for the next 30 days to our unedited content and supporter back posts. So any way you want to do it, you can do it your way. Head over to ko-fi.com slash squawking dead, or at least set up a coffee.com account, follow us, and then we'll see. You know, you'll get the post, you'll get the notifications, you'll know what's up. But regardless of what you do there, if you are listening to us on audio, head over to ratethispodcast.com slash squawking dead. Give us five stars and an eggplant and we'll know exactly what you're talking about. But if you want to write more, give us some feedback, let us know how we're doing, what we're doing wrong, let us know we'll take your feedback we'll mention it on the show why not I- i'd love that in any case thank you all for joining us i cannot wait for next to cut up these episodes first of all and then to cover the next episode of walking dead world beyond we'll see you real soon thanks for joining us bye bye i'm a serial, <laughs> I'm a serial killer yeah. stop you're gonna turn jenny on <laughs> <laughs>